what the Church of Scientology is so afraid of. This, this is, is SPTVZ. Today, we have an amazing treat, an absolute incredible story of someone who grew up in poverty and adversity of growing up as a child slave in a cult and went from that to graduating from the London School of Economics and publishing multiple books with some of the world's leading physicians and psychiatrists. Jamie Mustard, what are you doing here today? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, why am I here? I thought I would never be here. I made a decision that I would never be here. Um, the truth is that um, I carry a tremendous amount of shame and humiliation from what happened to me. And I pretty much had decided until a couple of months ago uh, that I was going to die with it. I just didn't like want the stigma of ever having been associated with it. But the reason I'm here is because um, there's new science that proves that uh, post-traumatic stress, which anyone who's been in that group, in that movement, uh, in the private Navy way, um, would have a biological injury, which is post-traumatic stress, which is actually not a disorder. It's an injury and it can now be remediated. And I've written a book on it with some of the world's leading, collaborating with some of the world's leading neuroscientists and psychiatrists. And I want this relief for not only the people that I grew up with or have been through this experience with me, I want to explain this biology to people. And I, but I want to, uh, I want to share my story because um, my story for too long has been owned by others who, you know, threaten to disconnect you from your family if you, if you, uh, if you tell the truth about yourself. And the reality is, to be who we want to be in the world, we need to own our story. So it's really, really bad. It's it's horrible enough the abuse and what I've lived through. I should be dead. Uh, but then to live through it and then not be allowed to share the story, um, it's just time. Yeah. I want to show everyone real quick the book. Well, there's a couple of books that I want to show my audience um, of yours. Okay. Uh, this is the one that you're talking about. I've already read this book. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, the Invisible Machine, The Startling Truth About Trauma and the Scientific Breakthrough That Can Transform Your Life. There's another book that literally just came out a day or two ago, a kid's book about resilience. You guys, you can get these books wherever books are sold. I listened to the audio book, which I absolutely loved now guys for those of you watching right now this is going to be a multi-hour chat we're not we're, we're going to go all over the place we're going to go uh we're going to cover an awful lot of ground so uh get comfortable uh get something to eat get something to drink get right re get ready for the long haul because uh well we've got a lot to discuss um and and i'll you know i'll, I'll break it out into uh into chapters so while you guys are getting comfortable I'm very quickly going to give you a word from the number one sponsor of SPTV. Hang in there, Jamie. You with me? I'm with you, buddy. All right. Guys, you got to be crazier than old man L. Ron Hubbard to still be carrying this around in your pocket. What you need is the amazing slim wallets and key cases from Ridge, the number one sponsor of SPTV. The wallet holds up to 12 cards. Very easy to pop the cards in and out. Keeps your cash secure. And the key case keeps my keys from scratching my phone in my pocket. Ridge has just come out with a whole bunch of new colors, including these nice metallic pastel colors with the matching money clip on the back. I got to say my personal favorite, the one I use every day, is still the black leather with the cash strap on the back. So check out Ridge's wallets, key cases, rings, and watches using my link ridge.com forward slash AA run to get 10% off everything site-wide. Use promo code AA run. Amazing. Okay. So Jamie, I titled this video from Scientology Child Slave to Psychiatry Collaborator. Now, one of the things that's incredible about your story, not just your personal story, but your family story and your heritage, is that your ancestors were slaves. They were. And then they get freedom, and then they join Scientology, and then you get essentially born into Scientology slavery, and now you've achieved your own uh, new freedom. Where do we want to even begin this story? Where, where would you like to begin? Well, I will say this, you know, I can trace my family. Uh, I have documentation that traces my family straight back to the freedom, freed slaves in 1865. In fact, we still have 70 acres of land in my family from the slave days. Okay. That still gets passed down in my family in Pickens, Mississippi. 
My grandmother grew up in the same town, Henning, Tennessee, as Alex Haley. He was a classmate of my um, Aunt Lucy. I met him once. Okay. Um, and my grandfather, my grandparents met at a black medical school. My grandfather was a physician. Um, he was a flight surgeon during World War II and a Tuskegee Airman. What's relevant about all this is by the time my grandfather, 75 years out of slavery in 1940s, 1940-ish, uh, he was, he inherited money. He was a millionaire when he went to Meharry Medical School. So it, you have 75 years, a, a family comes from nothing to rise to incredible prosperity. They come from slavery to rise to magnificent prosperity. And then the 60s and 70s happens. There's all these dark groups and I get born, and this is probably the most important part. I was born in West Los Angeles at UCLA Medical Center in the early 1970s. And I was taken at birth to the Asho Day House in downtown Los Angeles behind Tom, the original Tommy's Burgers, directly across from the Rampart Police Station, where I was in a baby factory for the first two years of my life. There are zero baby pictures of me. There might be one Polaroid from a trip to visit my grandmother. OK, so, you know, for those that might doubt my story or people that think what I have to say sounds, you know, outrageous, I, I, I offer the challenge of anyone to produce a baby picture of me. There wasn't one because for the two first two years of my life, I was in a baby factory in downtown L.A. with very with little to no human touch, diapers not getting changed, um, eyes crusted, um, nose not being. It was I can't even imagine. Um, why and how I'm still here. And then after that, where I went from there, it just, it's a gauntlet of uh, cuts and pain. There is, there are so many different routes we could take in this so, conversation. So the, the main thing that I want to say is my family had achieved something incredible. And then my grandfather is a physician and I am born into mental and physical slavery. I probably signed that billion year contract uh, for the first time when I was five to seven years, probably five years old, five to seven years old. OK, wow. yeah. So, I mean, if, if get, getting a child to sign a billion year contract and have and then I worked, I, I was not in school my entire life, except for a few kind of PR incidents that lasted a few months here or there. We moved to Eugene for a couple of years. I got straight F's and never attended class. So I was semi literate until the age of 19. I could read at a high level because I studied Lafayette stuff. OK, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, at 19 years old, I had a five, maybe a kindergarten or below writing level and mathematics level. I remember going after I escaped and it was an escape. Um, I ended up at my grandmother's house and I just remember a 45 to an hour conversation at 19 where she was trying to get me teach me how to use a comma. And I couldn't understand it. And two and a half to three years later. Two and a half years later, I was on my way to London School of Economics, which is one of the best schools in the world. So it's a crazy story of resilience. Wow. Who are your parents? Uh, my mother is Rosalind Reese Labou Mustard. She's uh, still in. We haven't talked in probably 20 years when I tried to handle what had happened to me as a child with people that represent that group, the, the private Navy. Um, they... Uh, we're like, well, your mom made those decisions. So you should talk to her. Okay. And I talked to her and uh, we did, you know, a uh, chaplain cycle or whatever. I can't even believe I just used that word. We did, what, <laughs> you, you, you know, I mean, I tried the, you know, the language is loaded, but the, the essence was she said that she had remorse and she was sorry. But the reality is like, I don't, I never knew my mother. I grew up in dorms until I, in except for a couple of years in Eugene, I grew up in dorms and then eventually was on my own from the age of 16. OK, so I literally when I say I grew up in dorms in an institutional environment, I'm being very literal about that. And it was a horror show. You know, the, the where I moved after the Asho Day House in downtown L.A. was a building on Melrose, a slum that you cannot even imagine where kids had were in bunks uh, stacked three high. And, you know, I was, you know, three years old and falling off the third bunk constantly. Right. Mm -hmm. And then just the caretakers that didn't give it, that didn't really care about us. And then I could tell you about some, you know, you don't have parents, you're not getting any sort of emotional needs met. There's 
the, the, the you have this Lord of the Flies thing. I mean, I, I hate even to call it the cadet orc. I would just call it the kid Navy, uh, you know, because it never really existed. It's, it's an apparition. It's a fucking fantasy. OK. Yeah. yeah and yeah. yeah. And uh, but some of there, there was a guy that ran that place. I don't know if you want me to name names, but. Uh, oh, yeah. No, please do. Please do. I think I think people appreciate um especially the under the radars and a lot of the old timers. Like I think it helps give context and perspective to know okay, who, I mean, knew, who knew who. So there was a guy who was older. He was probably 18 at the time. I mean, if I got the ages wrong, the guy named Bob Rafe, he was the CEO. <laughs> I hate to use the terms uh, or whatever of the, that, of the Lord of the flies inside that building. And <laughs> it was just, you know, my childhood was always, you know, concrete um, baking in the sun playgrounds with no cover and no parents and uh, you know, physical abuse. And I can tell you some of the physical abuses, you know, that I experienced there. One really stands out, you know, just that, that, that haunts me to this day. I mean, I was, but back then they used to do this thing called public spankings and they would order the parents to strip the kid in front of the, and all the other kids and naked and spank them in front of all the other kids hard. And it was such an out of body experience for us, the humiliation of it, to be on the other side of it. Okay. That we laughed. I mean, it's, we just couldn't even connect to what was happening in front of us. And at one point, my brother and I did something where we got ordered by Rafe to that. And I can say it is the single and only time my mother ever, ever stood up for me. The only mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and so that didn't happen to me, but I remember the names of kids that it happened to. I'm not going to name, I don't, I don't feel comfortable naming them. That's okay. okay. That's okay. Yeah. But, um, you know, it was a creepy time. You know, you never had parents, the, the, the mental weight of having these people take care of you that didn't like you and that just not having anyone around. Um, and just the way, what kids will do to each other and the poverty we're talking about roaches, you know, at one point after that building, there was two years I slept on a floor in the fountain building and every night I would pull a shirt over my mouth so that roaches wouldn't crawl in my mouth. I think one of the things that people have a hard time understanding is the poverty and also the location of some of these places. You know, I, I, I say sometimes that I was born in the belly of two beasts. You know, this this coercive control sci fi uh, group and inner city poverty with gangs, drugs and the violence that come from that, which was also something that I had to contend with and it bit me. Right. So. You know, it's it's decimated my family. And um, again, I thought I would die with this for, you know, before you and I started talking my in my mind, you know, I'm an artist. They took my childhood. I thought if I ever talk about this and are engaged in the conversation we're having now, then they get my adulthood. And I'm a I'm a pretty good artist. I don't want I never wanted, Aaron, people to look at my art through that lens of that weird, creepy thing. Yeah. So I was ready to die with it. And and, you know, the defilements of my body. Um, I mean, it was incredible. You know, I mean, at one point, you know, no one would even look at my body unless we made occasional trips every couple of years to New York. So there was one time where I was went to New York. My grandmother, who was very kind, was prosperous. And she put me in the tub. And I'm smiling and happy. You know, she's giving me warm milk and honey and ginger snaps. That was her signature. And she looks down in the tub and she, I'll never forget the look on her face. It was one of my earliest memories. And she just cringes. Her, her face looks horrified. And she screams. And my, my stepfather's name, he runs in the room. She looks at him and says, get the car. And I was in the emergency room. Really? So that was one of just what, malnourishment, malnourishment. No, or no, blood I, had, I had an infection that could have killed me. Oh, okay. And then after that, just a couple of years later, um, I mean, do you want to go into the grim stuff? Do you want to hear this? I, I, it's up to you. We don't have to. I mean, well, this is like one of the things that I feel like people don't understand is the level of poverty in the early days. You know, mm. everybody's experience is different. You might grow up at St. Hill. You might grow up in Australia. You might grow up, grow up, and you might grow up in the seventies. You might grow up in the eighties. You might grow up in the nineties. You might grow up at a ranch, not grow up at a ranch. You might have parents that are public that are so obsessed with going OT and giving all their money 
to the group that they never even look at you. Right. So every experience is different, but it's always abusive. OK, that's the one thing that it has in common. Right. But I will say that um, I don't think people understand the poverty we grew up in in the 70s. Uh, the roaches, the the, you know, the the, the, the the we had rugs in these places that were so dirty, they were a different color. The walls were stained with with bad plumbing. The rooms had the stench of steel. Um, so, and that, you know, it was a level of poverty in terms of roaches and rodents and mice and things like that. And then the head lice, I mean, mm. remind me to tell you the head, the head lice story is horrifying, like chronic head lice. And so bad that every time I got it again, that would be the only time again, my, most of my childhood, my mother was either at in Florida training or she was on the, you know, the, the Lafayette's reeducation group. OK, so um, the second time there was another time when I was six or seven, maybe a couple of years later, probably six, where I went to New York, another weird trip because no one ever looked at my body or looked at me. I don't really know. I don't. And uh, my, I kept complaining that I couldn't hear my mother. She thought I was faking and would whisper things because the hearing was in and out and try to prove to my grandmother that I was faking. OK, and um my grandmother was, let's just take him to see Dr. Gunning, a, a, a black female pediatrician from the from the West Indies that had worked and interned under my grandfather before he passed. We went to New Rochelle to meet with Dr. Gunning. She poked in my ears. This is just two years later. And um, uh, she said, Doroth Dorothy, you're going to have to put Jamie back in the car, drive him to the city, drive him to this hospital. He'll be having surgery in the morning. <sighs> it's a lot. Um, as a six-year-old boy to hear doctors say that you may never hear again properly, that was rough. I had to wear, I had my adenoids taken out. I had a severe infection in my head. I had my tonsils removed and then I had to wear silly putty in my ears for the next eight years while the tubes grew back because I um, because I could get no water in my ears. I wasn't allowed to go in swimming pools or the ocean or take showers. Wow. Yeah. And just because no one was looking, in fact, in that thing where my mother and I were trying to talk about it, because I'm a forgiving guy, I understand that a lot of the choices she made were based on her own childhood trauma. I think that's what made her, you know, what I would call a victim narcissist. Um, I have compassion and I'm a forgiving guy and I wanted to forgive her. I wanted a family. I wanted belonging. Right. Um, and one of the things she said is, I mean, I'll never forget this moment. And I gave her a two year clock. I said, you have a two year clock to show some sort of care and remorse because I don't know you. Give me a reason to know you. And let's start off with feeling bad about the suffering of children and the abandonment of children. Mm. Okay. And, uh, I gave her 24 months and it wound down. But in one of those conversations, she said to me, um, how would I know what happened to you? I wasn't there with no irony. And my, yeah. And my father absent, never around. I mean, we don't, that's even, we don't even need to get into that. You know, never knew him, barely knew him, you know, you know, knew him better than Daniel probably, which is not at all. <laughs> yeah. You and you know you and I have never met in person. We've only been speaking for a short amount of time. But I knew your mom in the Sea Org, mm -hmm. and she to me was someone who was a very obviously unhappy person. I could never understand why she was there, other than the fact that I sort of assumed she had nowhere else she could go. Like I mean, and like I said, I knew her in the Sea Org. We weren't friends. I don't even know that we ever even had a conversation. But I knew who Roz Reese was. Everyone knew who Roz Reese was. Um, I think a lot of my viewers who are former members will know one of your brothers, John O'Reese. Yeah. And I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna, you know, I'm careful about naming people, but I'll, but you know, if you do that, it's up to you. I mean, I'll respond, but I, you know, I, I mean, I'm not mentioning him because he's a bad yeah. guy. He was, he was a well-known, a well-known and well-respected Sea Org member. And whatever, it's the, sort of, whatever that means I, I, within the Sea Org, he was yeah, someone no, I, who I, was well-known and well-respected. I get it. I just don't, I don't even think that, that, that the Sea Org is a real thing. I, I, think it's a, I totally uh, get it. I mean, it's not incorporated. It's an amorphous, uh, abusive 
petri, you know, uh, uh, pressure chamber of, you know, uh, just feces and vomit. You know, we can get into the specifics on that if you want. But but um, but I hear you. He was he is a very good guy. When I, oh, I don't know that he is a good guy. You know, you know, he is a good guy. He is a good okay. guy. You know, we all have done bad things. He was born into it. I can't blame him for any decision he makes. He doesn't talk to me. I believe he's still involved. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, the only reason I moved back in with my mom when I was seven and a half or eight was because she came back from training and she needed a full time caregiver for him. And I was told that it was not only my job to get him to the daycare, which was at where the Rose Garden Pavilion is now. It was called the Annex. There was a big structure there. And I had to get there by foot and then get him back in the evening. Somehow she got him there in the morning. So I was his full-time caregiver as an infant. Um, that, you know, and so what I know what he's been through, you know, and, and, you know, he slept with his girlfriend when he was in at 16. He's a really smart, beautiful man. And for his trouble, of just following his hormones because they don't talk to you about that when you're in there. So you're just experiencing it and told you can't and you have to repress. There's no conversation. He slept with his girlfriend and as a result spent from 16 to 23, seven years on their re-education camp. And I didn't, you know, so, you know, I mean, you know, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg here, you know, and um, how this, you know, contributed to my work now. You know, I never thought that I would work in the trauma space. I really consider myself more of a pure artist and an art director. But, uh, you know, I got the I got this kind of proximity to some of the world's uh, leading neuroscientists and trauma scientists. And I saw some things that they maybe, maybe weren't putting together. And, uh, you know, wrote this book. I mean, Gabor Mate is on the front cover of that book and some of the world's, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, what's ironic about it, Aaron, is this, you know, I worked with some of these psychiatrists. What makes the psychiatrists that I work with different, um, aside from the fact that they're pretty famous. Um, let me, let me show the book real quick so people can see what we're talking about. So yeah, the, yeah. the invisible machine on the, um, who was the doctor that you just mentioned? Well, the doctor that I just mentioned, well, the guy that I wrote it with is Dr. Eugene Lipov, and he invented uh, a little under over a little under 20 years ago, a way to reset the nervous system and no one knows about it. And anybody that's been in that group in a, in a very close way, as well as, you know, the Mexicans, immigrants in the neighborhoods we grew up in, um, has a biological injury to their body, the nightmares, the hypervigilance, the sense of doom. And we can get into and I can get into the anatomy and science behind this, the hyper arousal, the lack of sleep, the ideation, um, all of that, the, rea the hair trigger, the reactivity, the, um, it all comes from a biological injury that we can now see on a brain scan and now can be remediated. We can reset the nervous system. It's new, but there's a, a, a private equity firm that is opening up clinics all over the United States. There's 35 clinics in the United States now where you can go and in a 15 minute procedure over two days, once you can do half of it one day, half of it the next day, um, you can go back to being a person. I, I wanna say that as I was reading The Invisible Machine, or should I say listening to it because I love audiobooks, I was struck, and you and I spoke about this because I was like, is it just me? Am I imagining something? I was struck by the fact that all of the, the trauma and the examples of trauma and the residual uh, PTSD-like effects of trauma that you discuss in your book, I was just immediately thrown back into Dianetics because L. Ron Hubbard has his whole entire theory of trauma, but that it's all based in these mental pictures and they're re-stimulated. And he has this whole, it's almost like the L. Ron Hubbard version of the Freudian subconscious, right? And I'm reading, and I'm listening to The Invisible Machine, and I'm like, you're talking about the same types of residual effects of trauma that is discussed in Dianetics, and yet the, the therapy that Dr. Eugene Lipov came up with and that you co-wrote this book about has nothing to do with counseling or talk therapy or anything like that, uh, at least not specifically. And I was like, oh my God, I don't even, I, I almost want to not give it away, but let's give it away. The, this treatment has to do with um, a, a particular injection. How about a particular injection? And in Dianetics, uh, 
L. Ron Hubbard says there's no such thing as a one shot clear. There's no such thing as a one shot clear. You have to do all this Dianetics therapy to get rid of all the uh, lasting effects of trauma. And yet what cracked me up is your book in some respects talks about the one shot clear. <laughs> well, that's my, <laughs> well, that, <laughs> listen, that's really by accident. And you have to, under, you have to understand Aaron that I'm in a very strange position. Right. And this is why I was never going to speak out. The biggest reason I was never going to speak out is because of the physical defilements of my body. I mean, shame, humiliation and fear. I'll say it. Shame, humiliation and fear. I was going to die with it. OK, but when, you know, I got this opportunity where I was invited to speak to special forces a few years ago and teach them about art and communication, because their job is different than other special operators in the military. Their job is to win hearts and minds. They build schools, they build mosques, they train people. So how to communicate is very important to them. And I got invited to Fort Bragg to teach them about communication. At that time, I was connected to this doctor that can reset the nervous system. It's called the dual sympathetic reset. And they saw that I had an interest. So they said, hey, stay an extra week or a few days and learn about post-traumatic stress. I was shocked that the most advanced military hospital in the world, Womack, was still calling it PTSD because we know it's an injury. And this, this thing that we're going to be talking about is one of the things we're going to be talking about. You know, Aaron, it's been out there. It's been the military is doing 20 to 30,000 of these a year, most like all combined. Obama endorsed this thing back in 2008. It's been on Rogan. It's been on 60 Minutes. It's been on CBS this morning. It's been on the doctor show a dozen times. What's, but whenever you see it, it's associated with the extreme. I never thought I had trauma. Honestly, I know that's crazy to say, but I, I and I'll, we'll, we'll get into some of the child labor stuff. Uh, I never thought I had trauma, but, you know, just back to this idea of me being in a weird position. I, you know, I, I had pause about writing this book because I thought if I write a book with a bunch of psychiatrists, all the, you know, there's a lot of good people in Lafayette's movement that I still like that I think are good people. And they're going to hate me because I've now aligned myself with psychiatry, the group that's responsible for the soul decline of this sector of the universe. Okay. And uh, then the psychiatrist, my psychiatrist friends, when they find out about my background, are going to dislike me because I was associated with this thing that wants to see them wiped out. But the reality is this, I had bought false constructs my entire life. And even after going and graduating from the London School of Economics, which is the European equivalent of Harvard, one of them, I still believed in this more, I think, more because I wanted my family and I didn't want to lose all my friends. At the point over 15 years ago that I broke free um, and then uh, I, uh, you know, I, I vowed to myself that I would never not believe I would never believe a false construct again. If I couldn't see the data and analyze the data science, um, I'm not going to believe it. Right. So I don't think it's a coincidence that I'd studied this thing, this nonsense, OK, of cellular memory and all this weird kind of stuff uh, in in. I, I just hate even to say the words. I mean, the language is just so ugly. Dianetic, the, Scient the Scientology, Scientology language. Yeah. Auditing an org. It all sounds like like the, like for a writer, like it's just got no poetry to it. OK. <laughs> OK. And I'm a writer, so I just I don't understand why the language is so ugly. And the language is the ultimate form of mind control. It is the most sophisticated mind control system ever invent, ever created in the history of the human species. Mm -hmm. Definitely the most elaborate, right? And the language is the, is the key to that control, okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm careful with the language, but I will say this. So I, I'm in this weird position. I do think that when I, I was doing a post-traumatic stress meeting at Fort Bragg, and one of the guys there that runs the health initiative task force for special forces um, showed after we after this long talk where I'm listening to horror stories and all these guys coming back are being told they have a disorder. And by now, I've seen enough data that I know it's a physical injury hmm. and I know it could be remediated. The military's delivering this. At, they're delivering this at Womack. OK, but even at Womack, the, the most advanced military hospital in the world, they were doing it off of a 10 year old paper. So we fixed that on that trip. The doc came with me, he did grand rounds. We, and so now Womack started doing it correctly. And Womack started sending people to his outfit in Chicago based on our work together that led to this book. But the, the, what I'll say is just to answer your one shot thing. After that meeting, 
this guy who runs the health initiative task force, he says to me, Jamie, do you know, have you ever heard of operator syndrome? And I said, uh, no, what the hell is that? And he says, it's, it's something that guys come back from Afghanistan with that um, even if they're never in a firefight, okay, um, they are, they have a series of symptoms that cascade into a series of mental or excuse me, physical ailments, autoimmune disease and orthopedic problems, even other forms of disease. Okay. But it starts off with these kind of mental ailments. There's seven or eight, you know, eight or nine of them. And um, I'm reading this list. And this is if you're never involved with firefight. So you can get this biological injury, which we will get into the science of two ways. One, you could, the highest cohort of people that get this are veterans and sexual assault victims. So one way you can get it is just seeing your buddy's head got, get off blown in front of you. If you have an overwhelming biological event, and again, I can explain the anatomy and the science, it will change your biology. Or the other way we get it, and this is the way that no one talks about, this is operator syndrome, is prolonged allostatic load. You're in Afghanistan. You don't ever get to a firefight, but there's an IED every day around the corner. And you're hearing about your friends dying. And you're away from your family and you don't know if you're ever going to go get back. That kind of stress where you think every day you could die, even if you're never in a firefight. In psychology, they have a term, they call it allostatic load. If you carry allostatic load for too long, and this is how I think most people get this biological injury, it changes your biology. And we now know how, and you can see it on a brain scan. It is real. Me, yeah. Let so me very quickly, okay. let me very quickly read the definition of allostatic load. Okay. Um, it says allostatic load refers to the cumulative burden of chronic stress and life events. It involves the interaction of different physiological symptoms at varying degrees of activity. When environmental challenges exceed the individual ability to cope, then allostatic overload ensues. Exactly. So I'm, so this guy pops this up on his phone. Okay. And I read the symptoms and and I'll read them right now. Anxiety, hair trigger, um, reactivity, hypervigilance, hyper arousal, mild paranoia, lack of sleep, nightmares, sense of doom. All of these things are things that you would experience if you were if a tiger leaped out at you, which we're about we're, we're meant to experience for about 30 to 90 seconds. When our biology gets changed, this system of fight or flight, which is in the neck right here and here, it talks to our amygdala, it gets stuck on. But, but here's where we get back to this one shot thing, Aaron. I see this and I'm in a military installation, okay? And I don't see the military. I see the Mexican neighborhoods I grew up in. There's no way you can grow up a Mexican immigrant in, in America. You can grow up black in a project and not have allostatic, chronic allostatic load and a biological injury. And then lastly, I see the kids I grew up with and the stress that we were under, the biological stress we were under from abusive people, you know, from not being allowed to cry to not having parents to the physical abuses that went on. OK, um, and I was so staggered. I called the doc immediately. We were we were on we were both on the base together. And I said, Doc, um, I'm learning here right now about operator syndrome caused by allostatic load. This is an exact layout of the biological injury. And uh, um, this is before we decided to write a book. And um, he said, I never thought about it before, but you're right. So what I'm trying to explain is that every single person that was ever close to that group in a private Navy way, okay, or, you know, sci-fi love boat way, um, the Captain Crunch way. Now, for my viewers, when you say private Navy, you mean the sea organization. I do. I do. Okay. Uh, or I'll, I can call it, you know, sci-fi love boat. Okay. Captain Davies, Space, Space Navy. <laughs> yeah. I had an interaction with him, a couple uh, that are interesting, uh, when I was a kid. Uh, but um, when I see this, um, I, I don't see the military. I see, I see Mexican people who I love, and I see the kids I grew up with. And so I called the doc. And that really was the moment that led me to kind of take a break from art for a couple of years and write a book with some of the leading trauma scientists um, and neuroscientists and psychiatrists in the world. Wow. Yeah. Can we can we discuss a little further? 
the difference between oh, oh yeah. Like, so I, I, the one shot question. Did I? Can no. I? Okay. Oh I no, yeah, 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 yeah. So no, so so I'll say this: if I had not been studying the nonsense, the absolute gobbledygook, muckety muck, and I don't even I don't even want to say the word. Like the language is so loaded, where your cells in your body remember what happens to you. Okay, which is not, which is just unprovable, never provable, um, or that um, uh, there's a file clerk, or you know all the stuff that we associate with the that the the, the diuretics. Okay, um, uh, <laughs> um, if I had not been studying that falsely and read that book two or three times in a in a in a study room and and like having to believe it because I, they reinforce you. Hey, would you like somebody else to have the experience? Like every time you finish something, you're reinforced that you believe in it. And you're, there's an examiner and a win and it's all manipulation. Uh, if I had not known, then I became Miss jo Johnny data, data science. Right. Uh, when I really truly left the group over 15 years ago, um, the, would I have recognized this as something that was beyond the military that was maybe affecting 30 to 40 percent of the U.S. population? No, there's no way. I don't think unless I'd had this false in this false study, this false knowledge that when I saw the real thing and there was science behind it and the military studied the crap out of it and um, Obama endorsed it back in 2008, um, I don't think I would have recognized it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to your one shot point, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Oh, yeah. no, it wasn't even a question surrounding that. It was like, and also when I mentioned to you this thing, to me, the irony of the one shot clear, you were like, well, you, you, I think you had said that wasn't even a term you were familiar with because you didn't necessarily listen. I'd to never the heard that term. I mean, maybe I'd heard it, but I never really heard it. And I never knew what it meant. I never really heard that term until you said it to me. I'd, I'd never heard of that. So what is that? Well, well, it's funny because when L. Ron Hubbard says there's no such thing as a one shot clear, he's not referring to a hypodermic shot. He's referring to there's no one thing that you can do that'll make someone magically clear. You've got to go through this whole, you know, counseling process. And yet, you know, in your book, um, the treatment for this post traumatic stress injury is, in fact, um, uh, various types of shots, a shot or various types of shots. I just thought it was kind of ironic. You you weren't even really familiar with the phrase one shot clear. It was just something I was uh, saying to you, I thought it was funny. Mo a lot of former Scientologists who've done auditor training will uh, will get the reference. That's all. I don't okay, want to beat okay. into that. <laughs> okay, okay. But yeah. But one thing I would like just to take the opportunity to discuss a little further is the difference between um, a disorder and an injury. Okay. A disorder is this amorphous thing that we can't really see. It's not testable. You can't do a blood test and tell if someone has bipolar disorder. Mm. Okay. Or schizophrenia. OK, but any, you know, uh, you can do a blood test and, and tell if someone has possibly an autoimmune disease or other forms of disease. Blood work tells us more about our health than anything else that exists. OK, so to me, so this idea of a disorder, um, it's not, you know, it's in the DSM. It exists. There's a huge campaign going on right now to change the name from post-traumatic stress disorder to physical injury because we know it. There's a guy that I worked with named Dr. Frank Ochberg. He's one of the most famous psychiatrists in America. And he, in 2012, with another doctor, started trying to get the name changed from post-traumatic stress disorder to injury because we now know it's a physical injury. Um, so a physical injury is like a broken leg. That it's, like, it's like a broken leg. You can see it, you can reset it, and you can move on. The other thing that makes the, the lie of a disorder because those symptoms, and, and a lot of you that are listening right now have them, even if you don't associate with trauma, um, it, the, the, those symptoms come with a disorder. And when they're actually a biological injury, which we should get into the anatomy of. Um, so if you're told you have a disorder when you have a broken leg, the stigma that goes along with that will, can destroy your life. Right. So that term disorder, it's incredibly stigmatizing and it's a lie. Yeah. OK, so it keeps people from getting better because they're not going to go and, and physically remediate their body, which we now have the tools to do if they're told they have this amorphous mental disorder that you can't test or see. Yeah. For anyone newly joining the stream, I just want to show you the book that talks about, well, this difference between post-traumatic stress disorder, as it's you know largely been known, 
And the difference between looking at it that way and, and, and acknowledging it's actually a physical injury in the central nervous system. Now, it, uh, you can get this book, The Invisible Machine, anywhere books are sold. It's available. Audiobook as well. Um, I listened to it. It was amazing to me. Because, you know, one of the things that I was <clears throat> occurring to me as I was reading this book is that, you know, I'm not a religious person. I'm not a spiritual person. Um, and, you know, if you don't believe in the spirit or whatever, the central nervous system is God. Kind of, right? So, I mean, uh, the central nervous system is our animating machine. And, you know, when you talk in the book about the allostatic load and, uh, you know, the, the prolonged effect, the, the physical injury that occurs to the central nervous system due to the prolonged exposure to certain very high stress situations, um, it, it makes so much sense. And also, you know, you mentioned before, um, a lot of people don't consider themselves to have trauma, you know, e even in the cult space, in the former cult space. Uh, even in the sexual survivor space, almost everybody suffers from what I'm going to uh, carelessly call imposter syndrome. They think they couldn't possibly be X, Y, Z because so many other people probably had it so much worse. They don't, it, no one's comfortable saying I am a victim of abuse or well, even I, worse because we're trained that a victim is worse or close to body death if, in Scientology if, based, sure. based on Lafayette's, you know, scale of emotion, right? But let me just comment on what you're saying um, real quickly because it's a, it's it's in it's important. You know, if you think about what uh, diuretics claims to solve, okay, um, which is junk, um, and then you combine that with Lafayette's abusive and stress in allostatic load inducing ways of running things. It's okay to yell, conditions, decks, you know. No HNR, no, you know, no human emotion and reaction. I mean, you know, no, you know, like, and then just the constant, that thing is run with a whip. You know that you were in it. It is run by the whip. It may, it's a different whip than this, than my, my great, great grandparents, but it's a very, it's a similar whip. Everything is done under threat on the plantation. Everything is done under threat on these, on Lafayette's bases. Okay. Everyone knows that. OK, even the people that disagree, you know, that are listening to this, that, that are trying to not believe it. OK, those activities. So you have this guy and he says, hey, I can solve this eight symptoms that I just named uh, are pretty much the same. Are most of the symptoms and the physical ailments that come from those symptoms are most of the symptoms that diuretics claims to cure. OK, um, if you. Uh, um, while he has a system of the people that are administrating this that causes the biological injury. It's dark. It's dark. So let's get into the biological injury for anybody that might be cynical. And before the end of this call, I will walk you through what's happening to you anatomically so that you're feeling these things and that it is not, and that it is 100% biological. You can see it on a brain scan and now it's remediatable. Okay. Um, but, you know, I'll go back to this. This guy, Dr. Frank Ockberg, who's all through this book, he writes the foreword to the book. He's one of the most famous psychiatrists in America. He was the guy that defined Stockholm Syndrome for the FBI in the 1970s. OK, so we're not just talking about a regular psychiatrist here. We're talking. I mean, when I told him a little bit about my childhood, I didn't tell him all of it. Uh, he, told, he told me that I was raised by wolves. OK, but, you know, I and that was the other thing. I'm friends with these guys. These guys are outliers for psychiatrists. Some of the most famous psychiatrists in the world, guys like Frank Ockberg, guys like Daniel Amen, guys like Stephen Porges. These guys have taken the biological approach, which has actually alienated them from the MP APA. But in, in oh, the wow. last 10 years, the data science has come in and all these guys that are approaching what we call I'll call mental wellness or mental issues as brain health and nervous system issues, the data science is proving these guys right. Daniel amon has been scanning people's brains for 20 years, or no, 30 years. He's got almost 200,000 brain scans. The SPEC scan is not an ideal scan. It only measures this. You can only see the surface and blood flow. But the data set is, and the corollaries are undeniable, okay? And he was an incredible partner for me in the creation of this book. I couldn't have done it without him. Uh, so... I was forced to start meeting these guys after having been programmed my whole life that, that they're the epitome of all evil. 
And I could just tell you the guys that I worked with have been the most compassionate, caring people I've ever met in my life that truly want to see people do better and make people better. But again, these are the, this is the biological camp of psychiatrists that I work with, which are not, which is not the normal camp. Okay. Um, and so I, I will, so this guy, Frank Ockberg, who again is a world famous uh, psychiatrist. He's not a regular psychiatrist, but he coined the term PTSI in 2012 um, and defined Stockholm syndrome for the FBI in the seventies. In 1970, he wrote a book. This is for, this is for anyone that's watching this right now that goes, come on, I'm going to, in the next 90 seconds, I'm going to show you how this is obvious. Okay. So back in 1970, he came out with a book called that he wrote with a bunch of Stanford scientists, Frank Ockberg and a bunch of Stanford scientists called Violence and the Struggle for Existence. That book came out on Little Brown two years after um, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Coretta Scott King did the foreword to that book, Martin Luther King's wife. In that book, there's a chapter called Biology and Aggression. This is 1970. And these doctors are saying in this book, we 100% know that trauma is biological. We 100% know it. We don't know how, but we know it. Here's how we know it. If you take a horse, a dog, a cat, an elephant, a zebra, any animal, and you just beat the crap out of it and torture the crap out of it for a month. I mean, just beat it and terrorize it, but allow it to live. And then you stop and you treat it like the Queen of England for the rest of its life or the chairman of the board of the religious technology center. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry for that. Had to do it. Uh, um, you treat it like a prince or a princess or a king for the rest of its life. That animal will never be the same. It will be, it will be one of two ways and it will never change. It will be incredibly aggressive fight or it will be incredibly meek flight. We didn't just give that horse a disorder. We didn't just give that cat or that dog a disorder. We've changed its biology. And until the mid to late, you know, like, you know, 2000, somewhere between 2006 and 2010, when Dr. Um, Ockberg and Dr. Lipov met, we, they met and now they work together. Um, so 25, you know, 35 years later, a little, little over 35 years later, the doctor uh, from that book, uh, we now know how, and we can now reset the nervous system. So amazing. Yeah. So, so, so anybody that has an animal should be able to relate to what I'm saying. You're, we didn't give those animals a disorder. We've changed its biology and you can see it on an fMRI and I can explain the anatomy of what that biological change is. And I could explain to you how we remediate it. And it's as simple as a mousetrap. Hmm. Why would there be a rift in the mental health community between, uh, whether something is a disorder or an injury, it would seem to me based on my a superficial understanding of uh, what these subjects believe, what these professionals believe that, <clears throat> well, okay, here's the character that Scientologists are taught about psychiatry. Okay. Everything that's wrong with you is a chemical imbalance in your brain. And, you know, even SSRIs work on, um, to some extent, regulating brain chemistry through a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor is what, you know, you've got the receptors, you've got the, 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 I don't know if chemical is the right word, but anyway, this idea that behavior is modified by brain chemistry to me, just casually speaking, that doesn't seem that different from think that, uh, from the idea that a prolonged psychological stress would create a physical injury in the nervous system. Why are these things? Okay. I'm going to give you, okay. I'm going to give you my, it's a great question. Great question, Aaron. I'm going to give you my opinion. Okay. When you're looking at a, per, a, a person that's suffering from a lot of, you know, the disorders that, um, I just named and, uh, and I'm going to explain to you why those symptoms, cause it has to do with Peter Levine's work back in the eighties, which is like what you'd experience if you were running from a tiger. Yeah. Um, if you look at the symptoms that someone experiences, if they've undergone, um, extreme allostatic load or an overwhelming catastrophic traumatic event, normally if you have an over a catastrophic event, you almost, or, you know, like you steer your car and you almost run off the road, but you catch yourself and you're elevated. You come you're elevated for five hours, you come back down to baseline. It's only when the injury is too overwhelming, like as in a sexual assault or war, that you never come back. You've changed, and I'm going to explain the biological change in the that occurs in the body and how we remediate it. 
um, or how the doctors remediate. Um, but uh, so, you know, my view on this, and this is all parts to part the bark like in the book, like how does this injury relate to psychotherapy, talk therapy? There's incredible therapeutics out there, you know, um, from ketamine to, you know, we don't, we don't have a ton of data on psilocybin, but I could talk about ketamine to EDM, EMDR, to RTM, to um, yoga m mitigates the nervous system. But my, from what I've observed, and I've been in this world immersed for the last, for the last several years, talking to some of the leading minds in the world, um, is it's about 70% the nervous system and 70 to 80% the nervous system and 20% the brain. So let's talk about the brain part. Okay. Um, here's the difference between, you know, a, the, you know, the, the mainstream psychiatric view, which is a chemical imbalance in your brain. And again, I don't want to speak for Dr. Amen. You, you can, he's the most famous psychiatrist in the United States. So you can look up his work. You can go on his website and look at his, you know, and see, see the data science, see these brain scans. Okay. But I mostly am talking about the nervous system part of this, but I saw so much TBI, traumatic brain injury and brain toxicity, what you get from drugs and alcohol that I had to end up making it a major part of the book. It was, it was part of the broken leg. Uh, with, the more I kind of immersed myself into the data. Right. But to answer your question, Aaron, um, here's the difference between a chemical imbalance in your brain. And again, I don't want to speak for Eamon, but this would be my interpretation. When you, when you get a hit to the head or you have a, you've had issues with drugs and alcohol, that causes irritations in the brain. You can see these irritations on an fMRI. You can see them on a spec scan, which is a surface scan that he uses. Over a data set of almost 200,000 brain scans over 30 years, they've been able to correlate those irritations in the brain, actual ir like damaged marks on the brain that you can see with various forms of anxiety, okay? Um, as well as, but one of the, the core things that you see when you see somebody that's had traumatic brain injury or, dr or brain toxicity from drugs and alcohol is reduced blood flow to the frontal cortex, which is our executive function. OK, so I think Eamon's going to talk about it more in a way of you can see the surface damage to the brain. He's not going to talk about it in terms of chemicals. He's going to talk about it in terms of brain irritations associated with uh, various uh, mental symptoms. You know, when I first met him, I kept calling it mental illness. And he looked at me like I was going to like I shot his dog or kicked his dog or something. And I said, what's wrong? What am I doing wrong? And he said, please don't use that word. I said, what are you talking about? He said, don't use that word. It's not true. Men what word? Mental illness. I said, well, then what is it? What, what, what word do you want me to use? And he said, brain health issues. So, Aaron, do you see the difference between decreased blood flow in certain parts of the brain, irritations that you can see in the bright part of the brain being associated with certain things that are symptomatic, and chemicals, which are, are, are the science on those chemicals is speculative. What makes Eamon's work is highly criticized because he uses a spec scan, which is very surface. But to me, you can see a lot in terms of these irritations. You can see a lot in terms of blood flow. And I find that data very convincing. Hmm. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I think I understood what you've said, although I'm not totally sure I could say, if I had to regurgitate it to someone else, that I would truly understand the difference. Because it seems to me that the, the, the mental health professional, the psychiatrist, the psychologist take on mental health issues is that and again, uh, you guys understand, I, I have no deep education in this, is that it still comes from, of a, it still has a physical derivative. Yeah, but, yeah, but I mean, we're talking about apples and oranges. Like if you were to go to Daniel Amen and you would ask him what percentage of your patients are on psychotropics, and he would be very defensive saying he's not, you know, saying he's not against drugs. You know, I would argue that he's saying that because he just doesn't want to deal with it. Okay. Um, but but uh, um, he would say 10%. If I, you then asked him what percentage of psych, other psychiatrists have patients that are on drugs, he would probably tell you 100%. I asked him one time uh, in a filmed interview, what percentage of people are walking, out, are walking around on psychotropics right now that just have a, physical, have a physical damage to their brain? And he said 80%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, what I would say, again, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make the point again. We're talking about, you're talking about chemicals and SSRIs and all this stuff. I'm not going near that. I'm talking about right. blood flow. And I'm talking about physical damage to the brain, which you could see in an fMRI. In other words, if you've got this one piece of the brain that's you can physically see has a bump on it, 
and then you've got 200,000 brain scans. And in 130,000 of those people that have that same bump in that same space, they have increased anxiety. Mm. Okay. The one thing that we do know is that people with post-traumatic stress have more norepinephrine in their brain, which is associated with anxiety. I think, they, I mean, again, I could have the, the, the science wrong on this, but I think it's something staggering, like 20% more, more norepinephrine in their brain, which you can see on an fMRI. I okay. Guess. So it's the difference between chemistry and actual physical injury. It's like, it's like, what, what if there's chemicals in my thigh that are causing my thigh not to work? That would be what a psychiatrist would say. The psychiatrist would say there's damage to the tissue in your thigh <laughs> uh, and the blood flow in your thigh is messed up and that's why it's not working. That's the I difference. Get it. Okay. I get it. I get it. I okay. get it. Okay. How were you able, as, as someone who grew up in Scientology, how were you able to get over the, the stigma that you would have had associated with the mental health industry? Um, it, it, you know, your own, your own bias against the industry. How were you able to get over that to eventually reach a point where you were productively collaborating with, you know, some of the industry's leading psychiatrists? Oh man. I mean, there's a couple stories I would say about that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> one funny story that was like maybe opened me up was I was in Ashland in the summer with a friend and we went to the hot tub and there was one guy in there reading like the New Yorker. And we get in the hot tub with this old man and we start talking to him. And he's like the nicest guy in the world. And then we say, what do you do? And then he says, uh, um, oh, I'm a psychiatrist. Blah, 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 right. And then we, me and my friend quickly out ourselves as people that were involved with, uh, I don't even know what I want to call it, um, Lafayette's uh, philosophy, okay? <laughs> um, his research, <laughs> okay? uh, which there's no documentation of, which was really him alone in a room coming up with ideas on the spot. So but, I, but, do you yeah. do you just not like saying the word Scientology? I just find the language to be ugly, and I don't. And and I but and again, I've I've carried a lot of shame and humiliation with it. Uh, again, I was never going to speak about it because I'm a really serious artist. I have a graphic novel coming out next year that I had um, that I art directed with an, a brilliant illustrator in Southern Italy. And people, you know, so my artwork is starting to come out. I'm a, I'm a highly accomplished art director slash designer. I think I'm better at it than most people. I, I humbly, I live in that world. And I never really wanted anyone to look at my art and go, oh, he's the X. That thing is just so weird. Okay. Like, like people like, think about this. This guy talks about affinity, reality, and communication, right? Like you have to have, be in like reality with people. And then he puts people in full Navy regalia in inner city Los Angeles. Like how, how ridiculous is that? I don't want to be associated with a sci-fi coercive, high coercive control group that, that love boat group that has people in full Navy regalia in inner city Los Angeles. And the new uniforms make you look like you, they're taken right out of key to life or you're a hotel valet. They're even worse, even though they're not Navy. Right. So um, which is, and there's, and they're, you know, uh, so, but to answer that your question, such a good point, uh, as far as it, him preaching how you should behave in order to have a good relationship to be in ARC with your community. And then he dresses them in a way that would be a total break in reality for pretty much everyone. Yeah. Because, because, and that, and that was, and that was thought out. Like any other, uh, his his philosophy, Scientology, has more in common with fascist communism than any other. It's a more elaborate form of fascist communism. If you look at the dot, it's very similar. You know, sacrifice the individual for the for the good of the state is identical to the uh, greatest good for the greatest number of dynamics. You have this highfalutin philosophy that means everyone is equal and everyone can be benefited. But the people at the top inure themselves and then they don't apply the rules to themselves. I think um, Lafayette believed what he wrote. But I also thought because he wrote it, he thought he could break his own rules and did. And there's plenty of evidence to show that he did. OK, um, he did not adhere to his own rules. And um, the, the minute he decided to make it an authoritarian group when he came up with the 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 private, you know, the private Navy um, is, let's call you know, it the space it, Navy. Let's call it the, the, space, space, Navy. the, the space Navy. Uh, it was, but it was doomed before that, because if you really break down 
the, what I call, I won't call it auditing. I don't like the words. I'll call it machine-based counseling. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just a way to induce dopamine. And when you're somebody that's a trained person, that's a machine-based counselor, and you're inducing someone to dopamine using these processes, you're going to be in forever because you're seeing people get really happy. You're seeing them, well, it works, right? But it doesn't work. You, the next day you go back to being the same. You haven't caused any permanent change in the person. There's no such thing as charge. It never comes off a thing called a case. It's all fantasy. But, but, um, but to answer your question, I'm in Ashland. We're in the hot tub with this dude. And I mentioned to this guy that we're ex-affiliation. We have an affiliation with this. And he kind of smiles and goes, I don't know much about it. And I realized that this in this moment that they're so insignificant. I know when you go to the events, like, Tell me done, say, I need to national explosion, I can't live. You know, um, or, you know, um, I'm, 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 I'm inner, I'm, uh, that's a really that's actually a really good impression of, of opening you know, up events. a new era of international expansion across the globe and nailing the coffin into the tomb of psychiatry. OK, <laughs> um, uh, when you really look at that, OK, um, they don't really much think about uh, that's all propaganda when I don't think so, that psychiatry even notices them. They're like. I don't want to make another comparison uh, to the little guy, okay? But they're like a little Dave, you know, maybe kicking somebody in the shins, okay? You know, they're like a little gnome kicking kicking a giant. He doesn't notice them, okay? And so, you know, and, and I love, you know, their argument, Lafayette's, you know, his movement, the Space Navy, their argument is that psychiatry has had this incredibly abusive past, and that's provable. So it's a really good argument, okay? But- uh, Lafayette doesn't, I could, what I could tell you would happen to me. Okay. I didn't go to school my entire life, never knew my parents and was physically abused and spent the first two years of my life entombed in my own mind, sitting in the waste and, 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 and foul stink of my own dirty diapers for hours on end. Okay. So, uh, with no human touch, and I don't think that I should even be alive, let alone able to speak to you right now. Okay. When you look at the gauntlet that continued, from there. So this argument that they have a history of abuses to me, you know, I was in the FBI raid, woken up from bed as a child, kept up all night as FBI agents flooded it. They broke, woke us from our bed at midnight. It was a 21 hour raid and they moved us around the main building all night um, of the Cedar sinai Hospital um, as a FBI agents kept flooding into the room. And all I can remember thinking as a, as a young boy was, um, why are they so concerned about these men with suits that seem fine? You know, like they didn't care about us yesterday, but all of a sudden we have to stay all night because there's men walking around in suits. It was very confusing. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So that was what, what my <clears throat> child mind, you know, was thinking at the time. Okay. Um, but, you know, so God, what did you just say? There was like, like the question. The original question was, how did you get over this? Okay. Um, Okay, so when my first book came out, I wrote a book on art and communication, and that's what got me invited to train the military, okay? Um, that's called The Iconist, um, which I believe I also sent you, to, or you read it. You, I read that one too. Okay. Yeah. Um, some very, very smart people endorsed that book. It won, award, it won, some, it won a, a book award, and it, you know, it changed my life, okay? I, the guy, you know, um, the guy that, that so when that book came out, I got a, a message on my website from a very esteemed psychiatrist, a guy that had run behavioral health for all of Humana, who was one of the top, mo one of the most accredited forensic psychiatrists in the world. And he basically just sent me a nice note saying, hey, I'm a huge fan. I'd love to talk. I want to pay you to come to L.A. and talk to inner city kids. And then we got on the phone and I just fell in love with this dude, his compassion, where he came from. I consider him a close friend. And um, that really is what opened me up was my relationship with this man, hmm. you know, um, and his, his compassion and him. And he's a data scientist. So he just would only talk to me about data. And I, and I guess I can say his name, you know. Sure. If you want. Um, he doesn't know I'm doing this. <laughs> Uh, but he, he is one of the most beautiful men that I've ever met in my life. His name is uh, Dr. John J. Faber, and he is an incredible human being. And yeah. so it was my relationship with him 
So then when I found out that there was a biological cure to way, a way to reset the nervous system, I, I grew up my whole life. This is like right at the beginning of COVID. I grew up my whole life not going to the doctor, mm-hmm. right? So this idea that I would go do this thing that people don't know about in Chicago, it was like vanilla sky, okay? I, it's just not something that somebody like me would ever do because I just don't go to, you know, you don't go to the doctor. And so I knew he had reached, I was friends with him and he vetted it for me. And that's what kind of led for me, led me to making the decision to go getting my nervous system reset. Wow. Yeah. So <clears throat> do you want to talk about the treatment itself? Um, yeah. So I, again, but again, but also to answer your question, Aaron, I'm still not over it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's all there's also a part of me that's like i don't know like i wouldn't see gonna pop the mask off and i'm gonna see the alien head you know what i mean so you're gonna it, wake it, up with an ice yeah. pick in your eye and a fucking yeah exactly so i'm still not mm. over it. that stuff runs deep you know like sometimes people were you know i don't feel like i'm healed from it i don't know that i'll ever be healed from it if mm. someone said to me how did you get over it how did you heal from it I wouldn't just talk about it that way. I would say it's like an open wound mm. and maybe it will always be an open wound. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the treatment itself, let me explain to you what happens when you have a traumatic event or you carry prolonged allostatic load, which is the nature of the space Navy. Okay. And guys, so, real quick um, for anyone new to the chat here, this is the book that we're talking about that uh, Jamie co-authored uh, the invisible machine the startling truth about trauma and the scientific breakthrough that can transform your life. So go ahead. Yeah. And then we've got, um, and some of the most uh, famous neuroscientists and trauma doctors in the world are on the back of that book, either collaborating with it or endorsing it. Okay. The book was published by one of the top science and health publishers in the world. uh, Bimbella books who published the China study, which is one of the most successful science and health books of all time. And it's distributed by Penguin Random House. Okay. I wrote the book with the person that invented the dual sympathetic reset, uh, which resets the nervous system in just a couple, in a few minutes over two days. Okay. But let me, before I tell you what the treatment is, let me explain the, um, and I hope Aaron, after this, we can get into, we could start pulling apart and having a conversation about a lot of this philosophy and the whole movement itself. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But um, scientifically, let me, or anatomically, let me explain what happens. So say you have, you almost swerve your car and you, your body gets jerked into action. If you were able to actually be able to notice how your body gets jerked into action, it comes from right here and right here. There's a gangle of nerves that runs from your amygdala straight down through your sinuses, through your neck, through your chest, all the way down to your toes. I would say for this conversation, the most important part of this conversation is uh, the part between in your neck and in your chest. Okay, so this doctor in the early 2000s, he is a he's the Einstein of modern anesthesiology, scientist and a researcher who who lived through incredible trauma himself. Uh, Probably should have never been an anesthesiologist. He was uh, on his way to being a surgeon. He grew up under the the the. um, crushed of the Soviet Union, was it? Uh, and um, he's an older man. And then uh, he had to drop out of being a surgeon when he was at Northwestern because his mother um, killed herself under the care of psychiatrists. Hmm. And so he became an anesthesiologist because he couldn't concentrate on being a surgeon, but it also left him room to be a researcher. So he was, there was a shot invented in 1925, okay? For tingling hands, okay? But let me go back to the anatomy. So the so when you almost swerve your car, you almost slip. And then before you could think, you catch yourself. That motion or that causes you to catch yourself before you could think or get your car back that elevates you, the hypervigilance, hyperarousal, that goes through amygdala and it's coming from right here. The select ganglion center of nerves on each side of your neck. Okay. Now, what happens is you go up five hours later, you'll come back down to baseline. Okay. Um, but what if that if, if you carry chronic allostatic load too long, which is the whole part of this is why I wrote the book, because no one's talking about that. This the military is doing this. Sexual assault victims are finding this. A private equity firm four years ago teamed up with a doctor and is opening up clinics all over the world. There's now 35 clinics in the United States. In five years, this will be LASIK. 
Because I believe when you start breaking down the numbers of people that have experienced catastrophic trauma or prolonged allostatic load, we're looking at 30 to 40% of the population conservatively. Mm. Okay, but, but oh, when you said LASIK, do you mean, do you mean LASIK like it'll be as common as LASIK? It'll I be as common as LASIK. Ah. It'll be as common as Botox. That's what I believe. Mm. Okay. Um, and, and, but, 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 uh, and again, this is not fantasy. This is a private equity firm. There's 35 clinics in the United States. They're called the Stella Center. I don't, I'm not, I don't work for them. I only would tell people to go there if they do it uh, because they have all the modern protocols. The doctor is the chief medical officer there, and it's not been uniform. It wasn't being done right at WOMAC, the most advanced military hospital in the world. So I would say if you're not getting it from Stella, you're not getting it. And I would also say anybody could follow me on Instagram, send me a message. And when we talk about what they're now starting to work on insurance companies and employers, it's not very expensive. But if you want to get this treatment, or you want to read, if you read the book and you want to get this treatment, make sure you contact me because I can get you a significant discount as an ambassador. Mm -hmm. But I don't make any money off of that and I'm not connected to them in any way. I just want people to get the correct protocols. Okay. And so as you I, had this treatment yourself. I did. I did. Um, so basically what happens is your, your brain sends a signal to this ganglion of nerves on each side of your neck, which is, we now know your sympathetic nervous system right here. Okay. And if that event is too overwhelming, OK, like as in you see your buddy's head get blown off, blown off in front of you, a rape. This, the system goes up and it does not come down. You get stuck in fight or flight. So you're basically have a set of mental symptoms that are equivalent to how you would feel if a tiger jumped out at you 2000 years ago in the jungle. I'm going to name them. This is operator syndrome in the military. And I think 30 to 40 percent of the U.S. population. There's so many people that I talk to that go, my never my husband never had trauma. And then I read your book and I realized he did have operator syndrome. His father told me he was, you know, a piece of crap his whole life. He never got hugged. Like for a child, that can trigger this. This system doesn't think. It's apathetic. Okay. So it, I, when people used to say to me, trauma is trauma, it used to really piss me off. Because I was like, really? Let's line mine up with yours. Okay. But now that I understand the science, I can 100% equivocally say trauma is trauma. This system does not think. So if you get an overwhelming traumatic event, like in a sexual assault, or as I said, war, the system gets stuck up. Here's what's happening anatomically. When, that, that, when, when it goes into system overload, your brain secretes two things. Norepinephrine, which is associated with anxiety. I think somebody with post-traumatic stress has something like 20% more norepinephrine in their brain, which is which you can see on an, on, a, on an fMRI and um, what, what's called um, NGF, nerve growth factor. Okay. So when that nerve growth factor enters the brain, um, it causes the nerves in the select ganglion right here to sprout. So say there's four nerves here and then this thing sends a signal and then you're up and then five hours later you're at baseline. Well, once that nerve growth factor comes in because you're carrying the, the stress too long, or um, the, you actually, they, there's something happens called sprouting where you had four nerves because of the nerve growth factor. Now you have eight nerves or 16 nerves. And so the signal reverses. So now 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you're on the phone, you're on, on the couch watching Netflix eating Cheetos and you feel like there's a threat and you don't know why. You're having nightmares and you don't know why, right? Um, that system is very useful if you're in a tiger infested jungle, if there's tigers everywhere, hypervigilance, that's where, again, it has this synchronicity with the um, diuretics, right? Is that, that it's a survival mechanism. You know, this that's is right. the, the well, doctor never calls it. Yeah. <clears throat> well, yeah. that's what I was. So that, that was the, um, the comparison that I was so struck by because when L Ron Hubbard talks about the reactive mind as he envisioned it. He talks about it as this thing that was very, very useful back in the old days, uh, you know, pre caveman days when there was threats everywhere. There was tigers everywhere. Uh, someone, something was getting ready to eat you at all times. And that this, this thing um, sprouted up. He never really uh, tried to put any theories together. No, he how did. It he sprouted did. Up. He, file no, no, he, cellular memory, right? But those aren't theories. Those are just names he's giving. Things. I know, but that's what he's saying is causing it, right? Sure, sure. But like, yeah. Uh, he's at it, um, that that this was a, a, a stimulus response mechanism designed to ensure your survival that was beneficial back then, 
but today is just never good. That, okay, when you know, I'm referring, I'm not referring back to him. I'm sure I no, use I know you're not. I've never heard anybody else use those words, like the doctors that I work with. Like I probably use those words because of my upbringing, but really I'm probably using those words because I'm referring back to this guy, uh, Peter Levine. I, I'm, I'm, I may get the date of his book, who was writing in the 80s and he wrote a book called Running from the Tiger. And he, I'm making the opposite point. Not okay. that you're taking from him, yeah. but that he back then is descri- it was attempting to describe something that has in reality this physical yes he was right about source. that yeah he was right about and that and he's given this whole he created you know, a whole construct that you can't yeah. see in a brain scan that, that, that it's a phantom that doesn't exist he created yeah. this whole construct that doesn't exist based right. on something that was actually true so it's not cellular memory and i'm not going to even say i don't i hate using the words because it's like there's this idea that there there's a you know, your cells remember things and, you know, it's, it's all very confusing because it also goes to your spirit and past life. I don't even want to get into using the words because it's, it's weird. Um, like when you, when you say, like, if I were to use a word, like the word ingram, like it doesn't mean anything because it's connected to a, a construct that doesn't really represent anything. So then it just takes us out of the conversation in my opinion. Okay. So I don't want to use, but, but I'll say this, Peter Levine, uh, uh, running from the tiger. So he had already just in the eighties, he was kind of describing this mechanism. Um, I mean, he's a PhD, I believe he's a psychiatrist, but he's, you know, one of the, he's the found, one of the founding fathers of trauma science. And he was basically saying, you know, you, there's a, you know, you get injured and now you are stuck in this mode of running from a tiger. So when you look at the symptoms, say there was a tiger that leaped out at you, how would you feel? I'm going to, I'm going to communicate the, the symptoms of operator syndrome again. You would be anxious if there was a tiger chasing you. You would have a hair trigger and you'd be reactive if a tiger chases you. You would have a sense of doom if a tiger was chasing you. You would have hypervigilance. Where's the tiger? You'd be hyper aroused. Where's the tiger? You would have mild paranoia and a sense of doom. In the military where people are trained to protect, the ultimate form of flight is suicide. In the neighborhoods where I grew up, in the inner city where the, the Space Navy is, you know, violence is acceptable there. So the ultimate form of fight is homicide. These are all just biological symptoms. And what's interesting is if you read about operator syndrome, which is basically an overactive sympathetic nervous system, um, there is a cascade of physiological problems that come from that. We now know through data science that the leading cause of disease in adults is what's called your ACEs score, adverse childhood experiences. That's been proven. So that now, but we didn't, but, but, the, but we don't know. So if, you know, Bessel van der Kolk wrote this book called if the body keeps the score, it does. And if the body keeps the score, then the sympathetic nervous system is the scorekeeper. That's what I would say. Okay. So once you've sprouted these nerves, so imagine, imagine this scenario, you're a young black kid that grew up in the projects in the Bronx. So the pressure of the gangs and the poverty and what that is, you're going to have an overactive sympathetic nervous system 100% of the time. I'm a police officer. I, every time I pull someone over, are they going to shoot me? I'm carrying that stress every day. Um, I'm going to have an overactive sympathetic nervous system. They have an innocuous traffic stop. These extra sprouted nerves in their neck is telling, lying to their brain, telling them that this simple innocuous encounter is life or death. Mm. That's why you see so many of these situations get crazy and out of control is it's a biological mechanism. And it's very important that people know about it because we're a nation of laws. There, I want, One of the things I did two and, a half, two, two and a half years ago is I went into a large, massive jail the size of a prison in the American South, and I interviewed murderers because I wanted to see if a guy from the projects who committed an impulse crime when they were 20 had the exact same biological symptoms as somebody coming back from Afghanistan, a war hero. And they're identical because it's biological. OK, so what all that. So let's talk about the treatment. All that happens. So what the doctor does and the pharmaceutical companies will never back this because what he does is he takes the same. The shot has been innovated. Like, the, the, again, the military has been doing this for almost 20 years. They researched it the most right now. Um, uh, so it's, it's fair. It's pretty mainstream where it hasn't been mainstream is, you know, immigrants, people that grow up poor, people that grow up in high course of control groups, a a relate a bad relationship, right? That's why I think the numbers are so high. And also the other thing you have to understand is if 
this was 2000 years ago and we're took, looking at this as a survival mechanism per se. Nature has a massive mitigating effect on the nervous system. It causes the nervous system to constantly calm down. The minute we're around animals or nature, our nervous system comes down. So when this system was created, it was in environments where we also had a mitigating factor. Now we live in these synthetic boxes, in these synthetic concrete environments. We get into another synthetic box with wheels to go to another synthetic box to works. So many of us are living, most of us are living in environments where there's nothing to mitigate the nervous system. So it's made worse, if that makes sense. But so basically all the doctor is doing is he's making a dual injection. Again, we know the shot is safe. It's hundred years old. It was first invented in 1925 to, uh, for tingling hands. When he was doing research on women, Dr. Lipov, uh, uh, 25 years ago, um, or no, in the early 2000s, sorry, uh, to see, he thought maybe there was a connection between tingling hands and, and menopause and hot flashes. So he was moving this shot around in the chest and the neck to see if there was, that he could, if he could basically relieve hot flashes. Um, and he was able to do that. And he was, you know, the Chicago Tri Tribune did a story on him where they mocked him, you know, like, you know, doctor plunging, you know, six inch needles, which they're not into, you know, hot moms or something. They mocked him, you know, three years later, when the data science came out, he was hailed as a genius. And the, the Norwegian government flew him out to treat, to treat all of their top medical professionals. And now, hold nobody, on, Jamie, because because yeah. you had me at hot moms. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <clears throat> by the way, for anyone just joining the stream, this is we're talking about the treatment as described in the book that Jamie co-wrote called The Invisible Machine, The Startling Truth About Trauma and the Scientific Breakthrough That Can Transform Your Life. All right. I just wanted to say hot moms. Please continue. OK, so what he's all so what, what happened is he, so he's, he's not interested in trauma. This guy, he's just interested in relieving menopause. He's, he innovates this 100 year old shot. And some of these women start can't coming to him and saying that their post-traumatic stress went away and he, and, and it's consistent and he can't understand it and he can't believe it. So he starts researching and basically he had found the sympathetic nervous system and then he's innovated the shot up until about 10 years ago, the shot was done at the lower right C6 vertebra. They use an injection sound to find the stellate ganglion. They use an ultrasound and then he injects the same $2 amount of anesthetic that goes into an epidural bufivacaine. And he basically turns off the sympathetic nervous system. It turns back on 10 minutes later at baseline. So what happened, so the shot has been, it was, when they were doing it 10 years ago, only at the lower right C6, it was 70% effective in the permanent relief of of uh, post-traumatic stress, the extreme symptoms of post-traumatic stress. One of the leading uh, neuroscientists, one of the neuroscientists that I work with who I was trying to convince to help me when I explained this to him, he was leery of it. And he said, let me research it. And we were on the phone. He was looking at papers and he said, you know, Jamie, there's a really credible study in front of me. And he knew he was not looking like he was going to help me. And he said, there's a really credible study in front of me that says this thing is 70% effective in the permanent relief of the most extreme uh, post-traumatic stress symptoms. I said, um, that's an old paper. With the new modifications of the last seven years to 10 years, it's now 85 to 90% effective. That doctor leans into the Zoom and says to me, um, Jamie, at 70%, this wins the Nobel Prize. I'll help you. Okay. Um, but what's happening anatomically is he makes the injection. So, so now it's changed. We have modern, it, now we do two injections on each side. So it's, we, it's called the dual sympathetic reset. We do two injections, one at the C3 and one at the C7 vertebra, uh, back to back. Okay. And you can only do one side per day. Adult, it switches at puberty. Childhood trauma is on the left side. They'll only do that the second day. Adult, it switches over on the right side. That's what they found consistently across the board. OK, so somebody with childhood trauma is going to have to get bilateral and come back the same the next day. But basically, um, he, he does this injection on the right side first, two injections using an ultrasound with a local anesthetic. There's no drugs. It's like less last less time than Novocaine local. It turns off the sympathetic nervous system turns. OK, it turns back on, um, on uh, 10 minutes later at baseline pre-trauma state. Here's what's an happening anatomically in the body. Um, the nerve the, the, instantly the norepinephrine level is going back to normal. 
this extra norepinephrine in the brain, which is associated with anxiety. More importantly, the NGF recedes, the nerve growth factor goes back to normal. Once the nerve, the extra nerve growth factor is gone, the extra nerves cannot support themselves. So now where you had 16, but before you had four, but then you had the sprouting of 16, now you're back to four. It's like rebooting a computer. And so many therapists around the world, all these incredible therapy, therapists that practice EMDR, talk therapy, every other kind of therapy you can name, one of the things that they're saying is that somebody goes gets the dual sympathetic reset, they make more progress in 20 days than they have in 20 years. Because with, it's like trying to do physical therapy over a broken leg, okay? You need to reset the leg, then do the physical therapy. Other, you're, otherwise, it's like running, it's like trying to run software um, on a broken computer. Fix the computer, then run the software. And one of the things that's so startling that is one of the things I never like to do is show people video of people that have been heavily traumatized waking up from the procedure. Because you can you can get it while awake with a local anesthetic, or you can get it twilight. It only takes five, 10 minutes. But a lot of people go to sleep, and when they wake up, or even if they don't wake up, as the things turn, as as the sympathetic turns back on 10 minutes later, the emo you see Delta Force guys. I mean, I sent a guy, one of the first guys I sent from Fort Bragg to get the correct treatment in Chicago was a guy that led the mission that captured Saddam Hussein and was a Black Hawk Down survivor. He had probably had the most hypersympathetic I'd ever seen in my life. Um, but what happens is when the, when this thing comes back online 10 minutes later is the bufivacaine wears off, okay? They use it because epidurals need to wear off fast, okay? Um, you see this, you'll see somebody connecting to their emotion for the first time in 40 years, 20 years. And it's dramatic. Sometimes they're laughing. They're, it looks like they're on drugs. So I hate to show it, but, but there's no drug. You've just, it's like, it's like, it, it's less than, it would be like getting a root canal. And then after the root canal, you're like, hey, hey, what's going on? You're like, or you're just trying. They're just, they don't have this biological imperative keeping from connecting to themselves. So, you know, we can get into what I've experienced in doing and the changes in my own personal life. I never expected to write a book on it. You know, I went in did the treatment. And at the end of that day, the, 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 the doctor, who's an anesthesiologist, did something he'd never done in 20 years. He came into the room and he said, hey, you know, I hear you're, I'm supposed to treat you like a VIP. I said, well, I'm a writer. I don't know that I'm a VIP. And then he left, I guess he, and then he came back and he said, this will wear off in seven hours. Um, can I take you to dinner? And then we went out in the middle of COVID to a Mexican restaurant in <laughs> Chicago. And this guy gave me a three hour lecture on the, on the, physiology of this thing. And it made sense to me. And I was experiencing that relief that day. I didn't really get my relief till day two, which was the left side, which is childhood trauma. It switches at puberty. And again, you have to, they'll only do that on the second day. Um, but um, so, so yeah, what's happening in the brain, the norepinephrine recedes, the NGF, the nerve growth factor goes back to normal. The nerves can't, these extra nerves that are causing the signal to reverse, telling your life is in danger 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, with the nerves going back to normal, uh, that reverse signal goes away and your, your system is back on. It's not a lobotomy. If you get re-traumatized, then you would have to get retreated. Wow. What, how would people get this treatment like? If anyone's watching and wants to get the treatment, how would they go about doing that? I think they should reach out to, I'll give you a link so that anybody that is listening to this, people feel free to follow me on Instagram and reach out to me and I'll get you a discount, a significant discount. I'll get you 40% off or 30% like, 30 off or something like that. 30. But like physically, yeah. or you said there's like 30 clinics. Are these the only places where someone can get this treatment? Um, no, there's other people that do it, but I, you know, I think there's the, the Stella doc, the Stella center has the doctor is the chief medical officer who I wrote the book with. And I believe that his protocols are the best in the world. I don't, I'm not to say that there aren't other good doctors, but in my opinion, if you're not getting this, and again, I don't have, I don't get anything from them. I don't work with them. Um, other than I believe that you need to be getting the Stella protocols. And the, uh, four years ago, a, a, a multi-billion dollar private equity firm started up started the Cella Center to open up clinics all over the world. There's 35 clinics in the United States. My suggestion, they now opened massive flagships in Chicago, New York, Washington, D.C., and Orange County. Oh, there's a word that you're saying that I think I keep, it's hard for me to hear it. The Stella Center. Yeah, that has, the Dr. Lipov is the chief medical officer there. 
Ah. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you know, Aaron, it goes back to the question of why I'm here. You know, I got, I finally eight, five, six years ago, went to a therapist for the first time, got diagnosed after eight weeks with post-traumatic stress. Um, I laughed in the therapist's face because I thought I, because I, the last thing I was ever going to admit was that I was a victim. This woman, when I laughed in her face after the stories that I told her, I mean, she looked like she was going to cry. And she said, Jamie, have you been listening to the stories you've been telling me? I said, of course. And then she said, how could you not? Hmm. And I got to tell you, it was another one of those moments, Aaron, where like part of my life narrative, when you grow up in this group and you've been so indoctrinated, you know, the, the, the decompression or that they call it or the wear off period, or the figuring it out period takes a long time. But you'll also have huge moments of, oh, my God, right, where you'll lose huge chunks of it. So this was one of those moments where this woman looked at me and I went, oh, my God, I'm a I'm a liar. Mm. I'm a complete liar. I'm I have been victimized. I am a victim of extreme. I would almost call uh, physiological torture and abuse that lasted years. And because I was taught the last thing you could ever be is a victim. And. So I had met a military doctor that had just who had worked at TAPS for 15 years that had just become the chief psychology officer at the Stella Center. And she started telling me about how new science had showed that post-traumatic stress was disorder and they could now um, uh, remediate the nervous system. OK, I. I like the I, it instantly was like, oh, my God, and I'd become friends with the psychiatrist and he had never heard of it. He was only treating the brain. OK. And I mean, he'd heard of it, but he knew nothing about it. He's, and, and then he gave me a very good way to evaluate. It's completely safe. They've been doing it for 100 years. It's got, um, they use an ultrasound. You can't really miss. Go to, but, but what he explained to me is like, okay, what's the potential downside? Like, what's the danger of it? How invasive is it? Okay. And what's the potential upside? And, it, and, uh, and then he sent me some papers and based on the construct that he gave me in which I should choose to get it or not, it was very obvious that I should go get it. So I braved COVID, I braved COVID in the middle of, there's nobody on the plane. It was the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I was on the plane with five people and went to Chicago. It was very much like Vanilla Sky to the surgical center in downtown Chicago and got these injections. And it was the most transformative thing I ever did for myself. And the way, I, one of the ways that I would best, Describe it because one of the things that happens is once you get used to it, you'll forget how you were before it and you'll forget how much it did for you. But what was happening for me is that some of the best days of my life, Aaron, were the worst days of my life. Anytime something good would happen, signing a major book deal, you know, getting some incredible art commission, you know, like, you know, things, things that, you know, winning a book, you know, winning, you know, a massive book award, you know, things that I, somebody who grew up not going to school there in life should have never been able to accomplish, right? One of the things um, that would happen is, is I couldn't enjoy it. I would only be thinking, but while signing the contract about everything that could go wrong, I would literally think these people are going to find out that I was somehow affiliated with Lafayette and his philosophy and take my deal away. That's the level of inculcation and indoctrination that I had. Um, so in the last few months, you know, you know, it's been, you know, uh, and again, I want to thank you. You helped me because I was just talk, talking to you um, just as a friend. And, you know, I never when I when you and I first started talking, I was never going to speak out. We were just talking. I just was curious about you. And I knew your wife back in the day uh, in L.A. And, um, you know, you know, you said some things to me, you know, I just wrote this kid's book on resilience. It just came out a kid's book about resilience on a kid's co. Uh, uh, and it's kids, book. they're one of the top, the largest uh, publishers in the world for kids. And they make, they only write books for kids on difficult topics, like a kid's book about war, a kid's book about cancer, all the things you're not supposed to talk about. And I was selected to write, a, it was on, a few years ago, they were on Oprah's Favorite Things. They'll be on Oprah's Favorite Things again this year. Um, and I was selected to write a book called A Kid's Book About Resilience. And one of the things is, a few months ago when I was writing, you know, writing that book, um, I was By the way, Jamie, I'm showing this on screen, and I just want to point out to everyone, the book came out like yesterday. So yeah, so if you go on, 
<laughs> it's on Amazon, but they have the back cover up. The thumbnail's wrong on Amazon. <clears throat> so if you go to Amazon to buy it, you'll see this orange thing that says kids are ready. They're fixing it. But that is the book. And you can order it by name, even though the thumbnail's wrong on Amazon. But buy it on Barnes & Noble if you want it. But I was writing this book, and I'm telling kids how I did it. A lot of times, everyone wants to know, how do you not go to school your whole life, be semi-literate? And the physical damage of the injury and also just being illiterate, it was wearing on my body. People were like, what was that like? And I always describe like Vincent D'Onofrio in Men in Black, when he's like the farmer that's been taken over by the aliens. That was me. <laughs> I just was a, com I was a complete wreck. I had a big mind, but I couldn't do five-year-old math. I couldn't use periods and sentences. Um, it was, and I was humiliated by it, 19 years old when I escaped. Um, so God, where were, oh yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm writing this book on resilience and, 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 and I'm, I'm saying things to kids in this book about doing things the hard way not running away from work from hard, but running toward hard. And when you get on the other, there's a lot more in the book. I'm just going to give you a teaser. I don't want to give the whole book away. Okay. But when you run toward hard and not away from it, when you move through hard, and again, not in that the way out is the way through thing, because <laughs> Jeff Hawkins says the way out is the way out. But when you move through hard, you, you do the work to learn and rebuild yourself brick by brick, which is hard. OK, when you are going to a community college and you're doing remedial English and remedial math meant for a five year old, that's hard at, at 20. That is fucking hard. And it makes me emotional because it was brutal. But um, I'm saying to these kids in a kid's book about resilience, when you when you can face hard and do it brick by brick, everything great in life mm. Um lies on the other side of hard. Okay. And what kept <clears throat> popping into my head, I think this is before I reached, you know, you and I were talking, what kept popping into my head is, uh, I wish I could face my shame. Huh. But again, that shame and that humiliation is very, and again, I wasn't molested. OK, and, I, and some of the kids I grew up with were. So I don't want to. I, I but so, you know, that was maybe the only thing that didn't happen. But when the sh a lot of the shame and affiliation, uh, a lot of the shame and humiliation that I carry, it's connected to what was physically done to me. In those years in the dorms. So. I'm telling these kids run toward hard, do hard, and you'll have a better life. And I'm thinking, well, what's the hardest thing that I'll never do is tell the truth about my childhood. And I just felt like a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. And the Invisible Machine's doing well. We won the National Indie Excellence Awards. We just won the Pencraft Award for Literature. Um, for um, I, uh, for literary excellence, the Pencraft Award for literary excellence, the National Indie Excellence Award, and the book's been selling, but like not the way it should. You know, it just should. It's it, like people keep writing me, telling me like, how come everybody in the world isn't talking about this, right? And I started to feel guilty. I thought the book would just be a New York Times bestseller, and I would be able to hide for the rest of my life. <laughs> but then I realized that if I was willing to talk to my community and share this with the people that have been through what I've been through that I could get people to feel, to not have this biological injury and feel the way, I, I, I don't want to sound cheesy when I say it, but I spent my whole life punching through a paper bag. Every good thing that ever happened to me was never enjoyable because it was like I would punch and the bag would move. I accomplished incredible things considering where I came from and I was not able to experience joy <clears throat> sometimes during a movie, you know? And... Um, but the now, and, and then the, the thing that was really powerful is like, anytime something bad would happen, the amount of my body would just be taken over. Like before the dual sympathy research set, I wouldn't be able to have this conversation with you. I would be back downstairs in my bathroom in the fetal position with, with cold water running on me. Like there was twice one time in an quote ethics office 
at ASHA where I, I, they asked me with it, when we were talking to my mother about looking at this, where they asked me to talk about what happened. And I got 30 seconds in and I broke down and I, I, what I felt inside, which I now know is physical, was so overwhelming. I just stopped and I said, I'm never going to look at that ever again. So the, even the things that we've talked about in this conversation before that reset, I wouldn't have been able to get through 10 seconds of it. Wow. Okay. Like, you know, it, it was, yeah, you know, I mean, even if without the abuse, if you would just look at, yeah, and sometimes there was abuse and I saw it as fun. I mean, there was one time when I was eight or nine years old, you know, I was there, I moved from this building, this brick building on Melrose to the Cedar Sinai before it was blue. And it was, and, and um, they, you know, I was, do, I would do child labor. They wrapped me up at eight years old in this hazmat suit with a, with a mask and Clyde and forced me to, you know, told me, I mean, they made it, they, they, you know, I forced, you know, they made me tell me it was my job to climb through these vents and clean the air vents with Royal jelly because of my body was small enough to fit in them. But one of the worst things that I did, I remember they were taking fiberglass out of the main building. I was nine years old, eight years old. And I would go without any sort of protective covering. I had, at the time I never saw my parents, but they, this was a rare time when John, when, when I was helping take care of Jonathan. So there was five of us living in a single room hovel at the fountain building. That's where I slept on the floor for two years and pulled my mouth, my shirt over my mouth every night. People don't understand the poverty. It never gets communicated. I've never seen, even Leah did an okay job, but it never gets communicated. How, the poverty that we grew up in in those buildings is far worse than the Mexican immigrants who we live next to. And, those were, and these are slums. People don't understand that these bases, at least the ones that we grew up in Los Angeles, they're in slums after downtown Los Angeles, which were in slums. Okay. Um, I, or where was, so, so I would come home, this fiberglass would be all over me and in my body. And I, my, I, my parents weren't home. It was like Jono, me, Roz, Randall, and Josh, five of us in a single room apartment. And I would take these baths that were so scalding, they would burn me. But the shards would float out. And then I would get up again and do it all the next day. In, that, in, my, 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 in my child mind at the time, I saw it as an adventure. And it was just a gauntlet, you know, like the physical stuff. Like if I just think of being four years old, five years old, like they'll call it the Apollo Training Academy. It was a slum, shitty office building across the street from pubs. OK, it was not a training academy. There was no schooling that occurred there. It was a dirt patch and concrete and with with ripped up tile. So I hate it when I see ex people or people that were involved use these terms like it was a real thing. OK, it was just a slum with a stupid Navy name. OK, where we warehoused ourselves all day. There was no schooling there. OK. Um, and I remember probably, the, you know, the you know, maybe there was a time when I was seven years old, hanging out there during the day, right when we moved and I got upset and quick, really quickly, these kind of, you know, the, the, it was the it was the worst of the worst that became nannies, except for a couple people. There was an amazing man that named Scott Foster that saved my life. But most of them, they were there being the nannies because they were the most useless. <laughs> okay. If you had some, you, you know what I mean? And so, and they the least happy. So, you know, this guy starts barking terms at me, you know, knock off the bank. Um, uh, no HNR. I didn't even know what it meant. Stop dramatizing. This is from two years, three years old. Anytime you cry, you're told you're dramatizing and you're being, it's your reactive mind. You're a toddler. You're not allowed to experience emotion. You're a trillion year old fallen God with all the experience, you know, of, of a billion lifetimes. Okay. And I think to not allow a child to be emotional is sadistic. And I remember when I was in the prison and I'm interviewing this murderer, he's in the book named Fred Miles. And he's been in for 37 years and he committed an impulse crime when he was a kid and he's got these symptoms. And I'm explaining the system to him. And he's like, 
what's interesting is when I explain the system to working class people or people that grew up poor in the projects, they get it in 30 seconds because they've mm -hmm. seen it their whole life. And I'm explaining this to this, this gang member named Fred. And he's, I mean, he's, you know, just like, he's just, he's, his life is flashing before him. Like if I had had that, I wouldn't be here. Okay. And one of the things he said in that conversation, which was filmed is I was there with two, with two HDR cinema cameras and two highly skilled cinematographers. Okay. Shooting in a cell in one of the largest jails in the American South. And he said, you know, his, he, this guy was born to, his mother was a prostitute. His father was a pimp. This is when, when he was born. And his mother was a drug addict when he was born. Talk about allostatic load, right? The, the, law, the Church of Scientology does not have a monopoly on human suffering and misery. And one of the reasons I wouldn't speak out is when I think about how bad it was. I'm a survivor. You know, I don't like that word. But like, I don't want to have my life be in reflection to what those guys did to me. That's an existential choice I make. Okay. But, but I am that. More, I mean, but I, but I wasn't a child soldier in Sierra Leone, right? So one of the things we have to understand is that this group does not have a monopoly on human misery. But now that we know that it's a biological injury, we now know that the kid in Sierra Leone has the exact same biological injury for a kid that grew up in the Sea Org or the Space Cadets or whatever you want to call it, okay? And that system doesn't think that injury is equal. It has a spectrum like a broken leg, but it's in a pretty much the same. If your brain is really healthy, your brain can mitigate against the nervous system a bit, okay? With a really, if you've had no hits to the head and done no drugs and alcohol. It wasn't helping me very much. My nervous system was, I lived in chronic anxiety so much that I didn't think when I did the treatment that it would necessarily work for me. When you're alone in a baby sitting in your own sick for hours on end, um, you know, I never had a baseline. Anxiety has been all I've ever known. I didn't know if it would work for me because I didn't have a previous state in my mind. I thought it was a part of me. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I, so yeah, so someone, it's not very expensive compared to all the other things you could do. Like for two months of stock therapy, you could afford to do this thing. And again, if you go through me, you'll pro they'll probably, I can get you a 25 to 30% discount, which makes it incredibly manageable compared to, um, you know, what it would normally cost. And uh, yeah. How would you like people to get in touch with you? Uh, I'd like people to follow me on Instagram and send me a note. Or so The thing is, Jamie, I haven't put your name in the title and your name's not on the screen other than Jamie. Well, so are you on Instagram as Jamie Mustard? I am. Jamie Mustard, the iconist. Okay. And in the, in the description video, in the video description, I'll put a link to your Instagram. Yeah. Put a link to my Instagram, put it, you can put a link to my website. They can send me a note on my website and I'll also give you, yeah, let's do that. I don't want my email box to be insane, but there's not, you know, I get emails from all over the world from people that read the book and there's not a person that I don't get back to. Okay. And again, I am not, well, I told the doc early on when I started working on this project, I am a art, I'm an artist. And, and, and I do a thing called identity work, kind of highly artistic form of branding that I've done for some of the biggest companies in the world. I told the doctor when I first started working with him, I said, you know, I'm not idealistic. I'm not some, I'm not, what do you call a person that only wants to do good? Like a do good. Altruistic. Altruistic. I'm not altruistic. I'm not. Doing but what do I know, Jamie? I grew up in a car. <laughs> well, I told him I wasn't altruistic and he should know that before partnering with me. Um, and, um. He said, I wouldn't trust you if you were. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I thought this book, which is only being applied to the military and sexual assault victims, which desperate and first responders who desperately need it. 25% of the U.S. population, maybe 100 people or 30%, 100 million people have this injury and they don't even know it exists. And the doctor is so focused on the military and first responders and sexual assault victims that if I don't do this, it's going to be 30 years before the word gets out. And now that there's places like if the Stella Center didn't exist, if that billionaire billion dollar firm didn't start opening up clinics all over the world, I would have never written this book because there would have been nowhere for people to get it. Everything, you know, the military provides it. And like I said, Obama endorsed it back in 2008 and the military's done incredible studies that prove it. 
Uh, but now it's going into the mainstream and, and uh, um, God, where were we? Um, so what's incredible for my life now, Aaron, is that I can experience good things in a whole new way. I mean, I still experience stress and pressure and I feel it. But when something bad happens, my body isn't overtaken. It used to be that if I got bad news, I would feel a, a dark hand on my spine. And it would take days if that news was bad enough to for that dark hand, that chill to subside. Hmm. It's, I'm, it's not perfect. I, I, put, I, I still have stress, but I have not felt that dark hand ever since. And I've gotten wow. horrible news in the interim. Wow. Uh, one, one more time, and we're not, we're not done with this chat, but I just wanted to take another opportunity here to uh, anyone just joining us. We're talking about the book, The Invisible Machine co-written by Jamie Mustard, the invisible, the invisible machine, the startling truth about trauma and the scientific breakthrough that can transform your life. You can buy the book wherever you get your books. You know, when I read the invisible machine mm -hmm. and when I read one of your other books, the iconist, you make reference that only a former Scientologist would recognize. You make reference to your upbringing in the Sea Org and Scientology without saying the word <laughs> Scientology or Sea Org. Mm -hmm. And I remember reading this and going, Holy shit. This guy's never told anyone. <laughs> and so my question to you is how hard has it been for you to get ready knowing that you're going to be talking about it for the first time? And you have all these people in your professional life who have no idea you were ever born into the Scientology cult. Well, some know because I had to call my, I had to call, I, I, I want, I knew I wanted to come and bring this book to the world. And so I called my publisher. It was a very difficult call. I was embarrassed and humiliated. I called my agent. This last couple of months has been a lot of difficult phone calls. Um, here's a one way I'll describe it. A moment of levity. You made me cry. This is like Oprah. Okay. Um, the way I used, the way I used to think about this thing was like this. It was like, it's like that scene in Pulp Fiction with Ving Roms and built Bruce Willis and the gimp and Bruce Willis comes back to save him. Okay. And now Ving has the gun. And he can, and Bruce has the sword and Ving can kill Bruce who got him into this situation in the first place, but then he saved him. Right. So you don't know what Ving is going to do. And Ving says, your LA privileges are revoked. Okay. One more thing. This stays between you, me and Mr. Short, Mr. About short end of his miserable life. Mr. Rapist here, right. That dies with us. Like that's what it was like. I was going to die with it. Because I can't impress upon people. And, you know, the the poverty, has that story has never been told. And the inner city violence and the inner city situations of violence that I had to deal with have never been told. Um, you know, just having helicopters come into your windows every night. And then just, you know, the, um, the gang... Uh, activities that I had to rump, run into at various points in my childhood that were um, rough and, and terrifying. Um, but so, you know, it's, it's two beasts, you know, the, 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 the group, the control, the constant psychological abuse of everything is made to your bad. Like, like you take overts and withholds, Oh, you're going to get this relief, right? No. The only reason those exist whether to write them up or in an interrogation or a security check, or whatever you want to call it, it's called an interrogation or writing up your transgressions is when you write up everything that you've done wrong, A, they now have that information. But the bigger reason is you look inward and you become small. That, that, that system exists as a mode of, 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 of uh, psychological control and it messes with you. And the only reason ov overts and withholds or transgressions and interrogations, sex checks, exists, even rudiments, is to make you pliable and to control you. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, so <laughs> for me, it's been hard. I mean, you know, we kept getting, you know, I kept pushing it. Um, I had a, and, I, and even then I thought about backing out. I, I wasn't set, set, set. I was not going to do it. In the last couple of weeks, I had an interaction with an ex uh, Sea Org member who had been an executive at Celebrity Center and then an executive at Nashville. And uh, that interaction, she'd reach out to me on Instagram. She was an old friend. I hate to turn people away. That interaction and how nasty she was, how psychotic she was. This is a woman that was, that was fitness boarded out of the 
uh, of the Sea Org for being crazy. You know, in just a, a one or two day interaction with her trying to be nice, she went crazy on me and wrote all these, like started accusing me of all these fantasies and wrote all these reports on me to a place that I have nothing to do with and have had nothing to do with for 15 years. She accused me of, uh, this is a, 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 being a plant. A church plant meant to take her out. I mean, we're science, talking about, like working for Scientology. Yeah, she accused me of working for Scientology to take her out. And I knew this woman 15 years ago or 20 years ago. She wasn't that crazy. She lost her mind. And so I thought if this woman is going to attack me for doing nothing and being kind to her, I loaned her some money that I'll never get back. Okay. Then uh, fuck it. You know, she's writing all these. And then she sent me all these, I didn't, all these reports accusing me of all sorts of weird, fantastical things with demon, you know, just complete and utter just strangeness, like schizophrenia. I'm sure I thought when I met her, she made it sound like she had been fit left because she wouldn't stop writing reports. It was obvious to me to use their term that they fitness ordered her out because she was type three or crazy. The first time I met her, she kind of control, met, controlled herself. The second time I saw that and then I never saw her again. And then she wrote all these reports on me where she accused me of being a Scientology plant meant to take her out. This is a woman that admitted to me that all these abuses existed. Mm -hmm. And that the church, she said, L. Ron Hubbard is a massive liar. He's mm -hmm. a scalawag. She glamorized it. This is a woman trying to get back into the Sea Org, who was an executive. It's a woman that um, uh, told me that she wanted to get back in to take it over because she agreed that it was corrupt. And then she reports me to them, accusing me of working for them. It was so batshit. That's when I was like, Fuck it. Okay. But, you know, I don't want, they say we're only as sick as our secrets. You know, it's, I don't want to, again, Aaron, I think very, very differently, you know, the way that I got through this. And again, if you want to know how I got through a lot of this, whether you're an adult or a kid, buy a kid's book about resilience. And I'll give there I lay out my formula for, or a formula for being under what should have killed me and my mindset. Okay. But I'll say this. I've never been angry at them. I don't have an ax to grind against them. I'm not trying to take them out. I've appreciated people like you and Leah who've made it easier for me to exist because it's just uh, by put by explaining it and putting it in the world. And, um, but I never thought I, I I'm not angry. I, 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 my, my view is like, if I'm hateful or angry then I, you know, that's like drinking. And I'm not saying this about you guys, but like, it's like drinking poison and like, listen, the, the main way I would characterize it is, is this, they took my childhood. It is a gauntlet, you know, of, if I, of just a thousand million cuts deep, some of which should have killed me. And I did not spoken to you know, another near death experience that I don't really want to talk about. But um, for me, when I figured, when I finished LSC and I went back, try to fix things with my parents. So I was involved a little bit just to, you know, but I never really did much, you know, but for me, at some point, the decision I made was this, if I go and I become an advocate and I'm so grateful for the advocates that exist from Mike Render to you, to Leah, then, then they get my adulthood. They get my childhood from me being their slave. And I was a slave, a physical slave. Okay. My grandparents in 75 years went to a level of prosperity in America. My grandfather was a millionaire in 1940 at medical school. He used to go work as a, as a porter at, at Meharry at the, at the train station in Nashville so that the other students wouldn't know that he was a month. He had money. Okay. 75 years. I can trace him right back to freed slaves. 75 years. And in the 60s, the madness of the 60s and 70s, my, my mother joins this dark group. And after all of that accomplishment, the grandson is born a slave. It's dark. And so they took my childhood. And I just felt if I spoke out, that they would be taking my adulthood in my efforts and my energy and my want. I, I make art. I make beautiful things. That's what I do every day. And, and, and I didn't. So 
So, um, but again, I'm, I'm, so that's, I didn't want to do that. And, and when, you know, somebody, a prominent person asked me, how did you do that? How do you go from being semi-literate, not knowing math, knowing how to write, having never gone to school pretty much your entire life, except for a few PR, you know, public relations things. I went to scout school in Eugene enough to get straight F's and be on the football team. And I worked at, didn't have glasses. I sat at the back of the class. I knew nothing. And I just warehoused myself there so I could play football. Um, there was three months at Lockwood Elementary School and that's it. Oh, there was a year at Apple School. There was a year where my grandmother sent me there. And that was just a torture going with all these middle class kids and then having to go back to the slum at night. So that was the only pure, and I don't know if it was a year, it might've been a semester, but we're probably talking about a combined year and a half, my entire childhood. Um, and uh, so I just didn't want to spend one more minute of energy on them. But when this guy asked me, this very prominent man asked me, how did you do that? And I said, it wasn't by being negative. You know, I'm just, I was a people pleaser. And I was just that kid that always was curious and wanted to make the best of any situation. So I don't, I'm so grateful to you guys that have been willing to put yourself out there because I have not. And again, that's one of the questions I would ask you right now, Aaron, like I'm, I'm even in, in doing this, I'm concerned about people looking at my, my art through the prism of that experience. Now that people will know that. Mm. Yeah. See, I think <clears throat> that it makes everything you've, you've accomplished even more incredible and more interesting and more noteworthy when people know that your background wasn't just growing up poor in LA, it was being raised in this human trafficking cult. Uh, I think you repeating that over, it, yeah, you, you said you saying that helped me what you just said. And also you saying that over and over, like, I do feel as if I was trafficked all the way until my adulthood. Yeah. Sorry. I cut you off. No, I mean, it just, it adds, uh, a, an incredible amount of depth, um, to your story in my opinion. Okay. And I was going to, I was going to ask you, I was going to ask you, you said a moment ago that they'd already took your childhood. If you spent time focusing on talking about them, they'd take your adulthood as well. I, uh, do, do you still feel that way? I still feel like I really, really want to make art. You know, listen, I believe art can create social change. I believe arts and entertainment is the future of social change. A pop culture book that reads like a novel that's in Barnes and Noble, that to me is a piece of art. I was the architect of that book, not the inventor, but the architect of the book, okay? Um, I worked on several writers helping with that book. They would all tell you, even my co-author, that I was the architect of the structure of the book, okay? Um, you know, one of the stories that's the famous story is the story of like, if this is true, how come everybody doesn't know about it? Or, you know, I, I asked Daniel Amen one time, if this brain stuff affects our mental wellness so much, how can, and, you, and you're the most famous psychiatrist in the United States. How come everyone isn't talking about it? And he showed me, he, he screen shared a, um, a quote from Max Planck, who, run the, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in the 1940s, that said, medical innovation is one in funerals. You have to wait for your opponents to die. Okay. <laughs> uh, so art can elevate something. I can, in, in a few years, and talking about it and sharing my story, and being vulnerable, I can make this this treatment known in three years rather than 30. There's a famous story of this scientist in Austria in the 1860s named Semmelweis. Have you ever heard of him? No. Semmelweis was a guy that this was at a time when, when babies in Austria and Germany were five times more likely to die. Mothers were five times more likely to die in childbirth at a hospital than at home, and they didn't know why. And at that time in the 1860s, doctors believed that um, uh, infection was carried by smells, by odors, okay? So a doctor would be doing a surgery or working on a cadaver. A, a mother would come over in the West Wing in Munich or Frank Frankfurt, and they would run over, not wash their hands, and deliver the baby. Well, this Austrian guy started going around Germany and Austria in 1860 saying, this is not smells. This is microbes. This is germs, Okay. And he started telling doctors to wash their hands. And he went on this crazy campaign of papers and telling people to wash their hands, which, okay, which we take for granted now. For his trouble, Semmelweis was put in a mental institution where he was beaten to death six weeks later. 
Okay. 30 years later, Louis Pasteur would prove that Semmelweis was, no, 20 years later, soon Louis Pasteur would prove Semmelweis right. Okay. So I don't want all the people listening, the people, there's probably a ton of people on this thing right now that know me. Okay. And that are suffering from the physiological injury, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, damage to the select ganglion and overactive sympathetic system. And all those symptoms, anxiety, hair trigger, reactivity, hypervigilance, hypoarousal, lack of sleep, mild paranoia, sense of doom, suicidal ideation, violent ideation. Um, and then it's all what would be happening if you were running from a tiger. 25% of these kids that come back from Afghanistan have ED. You can't have sex if you're running from a tiger. Okay. Speak for yourself. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to know why you never feel calm, you can never, or if you do yoga, it comes back the next day. It's because you have this damage to your sympathetic and now it can be reset. And again, some of the world's leading scientists collaborated and contributed to that book and endorsed that book. Um, but yeah, so, and you can also get it at Barnes and Noble. You can walk into a Barnes and Noble and grab it. So, you know, again, I'm not here, you know, one time uh, you have to understand, like, you know, selling the book and if someone can't absolutely afford the book, call me, I'll help you. I'll hook you up. Okay. I don't want that to be a barrier for people. Okay. But one time, you know, uh, you know, um, one time before another book, uh, an editor said to me, what's your goal for the end of this book? No, I you know she's, I think that that editor said that for this book too. What do you, what's the takeaway? And the takeaway is not for me to people, for me to convince people to go get their nervous systems reset, Aaron. The takeaway from this book is this. This is the example I'll give, okay? A few years ago, this movie came out. It ended up winning the Academy Award called Citizen Four. Now, when I walked into that movie, I had bought everything that the Obama administration had said. And I like Obama, okay? But I bought everything that the Obama administration said, that this guy was a traitor, and, in, in a, and just a greasy idiot that wanted to be famous and that he was this one of the worst traitors in American history, Ed Snowden. Hmm. Uh, so that is about Ed Snowden. After um, two hours of that movie, an hour and 45, two hours of the movie, I walked out of that movie thinking this guy may be the most important hero in American history in 100 years. It changed my view in two hours by showing the truth. This guy was always going to spend his life in jail when he decided to do this. He had money. He had a beautiful fiance. He was throwing everything in the garbage based on doing what was right. I would never do that. I'm too much of a coward to do that. Okay. But when I, what, what, what I want people to get from this book, even if they don't go to get the procedure, there's no way I, I explain how does weed work as a therapeutic? How does it work with the sympathetic? How does ketamine work? How does alcohol work? How does psilocybin work? All of it gets parsed apart. So you know what? THC runs ravage on the brain. I have no moral opinion on it. THC and alcohol ravage the brain. Ketamine is fertilizer for nerve growth in the brain. Hyper, we just rip. So every single therapeutic out there, we show you what works and shows you what doesn't. It's all biological. So if someone were to ask me, do you want someone to get the procedure? Is that why you're, you're talking? No. If someone never got it, and all they did is finish my book and know that what's going on in them is biological. I did my job. Mm. I'm happy because they're not stigmatizing themselves and they know they're not crazy. And I think this book, I don't think anyone could read this book and still think that they have a disorder or they're crazy if these symptoms and then the host of symptoms that come. One of the things if you Google operator syndrome all sorts of disease comes from that. There's a woman that wrote a book. She's now in the Biden administration. Her name is Nadine Burke Harris. She opened an inner city clinic in Oakland. The book is called The Deepest Well. And this woman was able to prove with data that the leading cause of disease in adults is um, uh, adverse childhood experiences, an overactive sympathetic nervous system, in my opinion. Okay. And so... If you look up operator syndrome, autoimmune does it like it, th this when your sympathetic is stuck on, it's wrecking your adrenals. Your cortisol is out of balance. Your hormones are out of balance. It is a precursor to every autoimmune disease, disease you can name. Um, it discombobulates the scavenger system in our immune system. 
which means, and, and there's all sorts of orthopedic problems that come from it. So we have this system that kills disease in our body. When you have an overactive sympathetic and your hormones are out of balance, that system doesn't work as well. So you're more predisposed for cancer and autoimmune diseases, right? Um, and the all the autoimmune stuff, so it's not just mental wellness. If you carry it around too long, it's going to result in the physiological destruction of your body. And um, that's in operator syndrome, if you, and it's in the book. Uh, since you're mentioning the book here, I just want to make sure everyone understands we're talking about the invisible machine, the startling truth about trauma and the scientific breakthrough that can transform your life. You can pick that up anywhere you get your books. Also, um, a little bit ago, you mentioned the book about resilience for kids, a kid's book about resilience. You can uh, check that out as well. Um, <clears throat> did you or did you not want to talk a bit about uh, Scientology? Not the childhood experience, but the subject itself. I mean, I'm happy to talk about the subject. I mean, do you want me to start or do you want to ask me a question? <laughs> I, I, I did. W were there things about it that you wanted to discuss, particularly? Well, I know one thing you've mentioned to me is that um, you you cringe a little bit when you hear former Scientologists, for example, calling themselves uh, second gens. I'm, I'm curious to know uh, your thoughts relating okay. to this. Okay. And then make sure before we end, I want to ask you about the truth rundown. Cause I never knew about that until the last, until Leah talked about it and Bruce Hines. And I don't really know what it is. So the fact that my little brother, who is a beautiful man that doesn't talk to me, um, did that, I want to know what he went through. So if you could tell me about that before we end this call, I would really appreciate it, Aaron. Okay. But yeah, so yeah, I cringe on this. Um, the biggest choice, the most important choice I made when it came to, um, disentangling myself. And I don't even know if I'm disentangled. There was a time about eight years ago where I thought I was disentangled <laughs> and I'm listening to John attack, talk about something on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a podcast. And he starts calling this thing, the SP doctrine. And I was like, well, no, I mean, everything, it's all bullshit, but that's real. And then he kept calling it a doctrine. And it's so funny because I have a degree from one of the best schools in the world where we study constructs and we rip about constructs. After I left, I would read books like 1984 and I would be like, thank God. Um, I uh, was never, never had thought control while I was under <laughs> it. Okay. I would see a movie, you know, that, that, that happened all the time where I was in a authoritarian uh, a thought control group and I would scoff at people or art or movies or books that I would read where people were, we were there, somebody was existing in it. I mean, that's how crazy and dark it is, but the language. So when I, when I listened to John attack and I went, Oh my God, that SP thing is not real. It's a false construct. Like I, my job was to rip apart constructs as a writer. And I still would for many years believed those constructs. And when they're just what was John? What was John referring to when 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 he says the SP construct? What is he even talking about? I'm not. He's I'm not basically sure. saying the idea of an SP is a made up thing. It's just a made up. It's a construct. Some constructs are true and are based on data. Some constructs are just made up and are and are harmful and hurtful. And mm. he and in that moment, I realized that SPs were fake, and the room started spinning. It was one of the last moments of entanglement. So let me right. ask you this though, because one of the easy one of the ways you know uh, uh, Scientologists are fed the SP doctrine is by using examples such as Hitler. So how is how are the Hitlers of the world either consistent or inconsistent with what we're calling the SP doctrine? I, I'm just curious to get your thoughts on it. Well, I think Hitler had an overactive sympathetic nervous system. He was a, he was a malignant narcissist, which I believe, like the, one of the things that I, the only thing that you cannot <clears throat> cure with a dual sympathetic reset, I'm convinced we have it, we don't know yet. Um, but I do not think malignant narcissists in the NPD, the psych, the APA, DSM sense of the word, I believe that's biological damage to the brain. And I do not think a dual sympathetic reset will fix it. OK, so you have somebody like Hitler who was a malignant narcissist. So he probably had brain damage and he had an overactive sympathetic nervous system. I can tell you a lot of things about his childhood. He grew up in a middle class home. He had a very, very oppressive father. All Hitler wanted to do was be a painter. He failed art school twice. He failed to get an art academy twice. And so he was a guy who was never allowed to live. He was living through his father, and I don't think he liked it. Um, but I think Hitler was a malignant narcissist, which means he had damage to his brain. And I think he had an overactive sympathetic nervous system. And that the combination of those two are dangerous. When you 
um, when you look at somebody like Aaron Hernandez or mm-hmm. OJ Symptom, what do those guys have in common? They have a thing called CTE, which is brain degradation from repeated concussions. That's all been documented. Okay. That reduces it, um, your executive function. It massively reduces the blood flow to your frontal cortex. Okay. So when you have somebody with an overactive sympathetic nervous system and their brain tells them that even the mild, most mild things are a threat constantly, sound like anyone you know? Um, and then you have your brain is degraded from CTE. So you ha- your executive function can't mitigate against that lie. That's when you get a Hitler or an OJ or somebody that does these horrific events. Something just occurred to me. <clears throat> so, L, um, so even when I was in Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard never uses the terms a technical SP versus an administrative SP. But I had sort of come to this conclusion on my own that based on what L. Ron Hubbard said was the technical explanation for how an SP is created, that in my mind, as a Scientologist, in my mind, I said, okay, so there's real SPs who are created the technical way. And then there's administrative SPs who just uh, didn't follow the rules. And so we called them an SP. Now, no, no, let me finish. Okay. Now, based on what L. Ron Hubbard said, the technical uh, explanation based on Scientology belief on how an SP is created, it's actually quite similar to what you're saying about the sympathetic uh, nervous system being overwhelmed, except he gives a past life description of it. And so just let me know if you've heard this, okay? So he goes, here's how an SP is created. And there's some long ago incident where this being was almost completely overwhelmed. You can't kill a being, but as close to killing a being as you can, completely overwhelmed. And he's, and so it's a, it's a, it's a massive moment of, of pain and unconsciousness. And he was almost completely destroyed as a being. And this incident was so um, heavy and meaningful for him that he's never actually moved on from that incident. He's still stuck in that incident. It could be millions, billions, trillions of years ago. But he might look like he's in present time. But really, his attention is stuck on this incident, and he equates everything and everyone in his present time environment with the sources of the overwhelm in the past. And so he sees everyone in his present time environment as a threat to his very survival and existence. And that's why he is either overtly or covertly trying to destroy anyone in his environment or fight against anything that would improve the ability uh, or awareness of anyone in his environment. And that's technically what makes SPs SPs. Does that sound familiar? It does. And I, and I can, and I can 100% say, like, if you look at these kids that are all, you've gotten so many of these kids to speak out, they have overactive sympathetics and they're pissed off. You know, the aftermath foundation is kind of doing what the church could easily do, or the organization could easily do. Right. Like we all know these kids were harmed. Okay. They stopped having babies because kids were getting pissed off and angry or, you know, the, the lie is, Oh, you know, parents were distracted. Right. It's not why the kids were, quote, flapping and creating massive problems. So we know that this existed. All this organization would have to do is what the governor, the president of Australia did a decade or so ago, which is make a public apology, as he, this guy did the aborigines, and create funds for improvement. When I say reparations, like I don't believe in reparations in the technical sense of like writing a check. But all that they would need to do is make a public apology to the children, stop the practices, create an educational fund with $5 million in it that they constantly replenish and uh, allow kids uh, acts to apply for this money for any kind of education they want, beauty school to college, with a public apology. They would save, that $5 million would be saved in attorney's fees in, a, in two years, okay? Um, so you guys are actually doing some of the repair work that they could easily do to fix it. And then this goes to the language thing. It's not about fixing it. It's about, we got to fucking hurt them. If you want to make a save the world omelet, you're going to have to crack a few skulls. And because that's the mentality, they'll never look at just the soft, easy handling that that you guys are actually kind of doing by helping people. Okay. Back to the language. So yes, if somebody has an overactive sympathetic, they're seeing a threat everywhere. They're overreacting and treating somebody that's benevolent as a threat. That would be a characteristic of a suppressive. But that's a fake doctor. There's no such thing as a suppressive. You add brain damage, right? If you look at a brain scan and you look at somebody that's had a lot of TBI in a car accident, you're going to have also decreased blood flow to the frontal cortex. If you look at somebody, if you go to a prison where most people self, 99% of the people self-identify as having drug and alcohol problems, 
you're going to see brain toxicity. What are you going to see? Re decreased blood flow to the frontal cortex, just like a TBI. They call it brain toxicity. So imagine if you're poor, you're growing up with an overactive sympathetic nervous system. And if you use drugs and alcohol as a salve, or you've ta taken a hit to the head, you're likely, your executive function is compromised. So that is that is an SP, but the SP doctrine of like there's just evil people out there and two and a half percent, it's you know bananas. It doesn't exist. And I had to when I when I was realizing this as I was listening to John talking, the, literally the room started to move around me. I had to sit down. <laughs> right, but let's go get back to the language. I, the language is the primary mode of control. Okay, all of these ugly words, I and mean, they're not ugly because. They, they're connected to the church or they're connected to Scientology. They're ugly because they have no poetry. Auditing. It's confusing. It's like the IRS or, you know, org. It's very close to like Lugi, right? It's it's Neruda, a beautiful poet. Like he, it would make his skin crawl to look at this lexicon. But he invented words, right? So one of the things that these words do is they stigmatize us. I lived a huge part of my life being told I was, even though I was born into it, signed that contract the first time when I was five, I was so illiterate and was looking at a life of manual labor. One of my friends convinced me to re-sign it at 16, at 17. Okay. Um, then for the rest of my life, after I escaped, I was an ex Sea Org member. Mm. And I took on that stigma. I believed it. Uh, they, uh. they were stalking me while I was at the London School of Economics, like a, like a slave on the run. OK. Wow. And um, uh, so and then or an ex Scientologist, you're basically extending. They're all someone asked me, Aaron, if you could describe Scientology in one word, what would it be? Human trafficking cult. OK, that's too, OK. So we'll use uh, five words. The second thing I would say would be judgment. Oh, it's, oh, it's, oh, yeah. Oh, it's, describe it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I describe them, it's, it's a pretty judge. It's. It's the most judgiest group on the planet. There's ah. the word, words you'll never hear from Sea Org executives and Scientologists. Grace. Mm. And the only time you'll hear the word compassion is when it's associated with the re-education program, which is a brutal destruction of a human being physically and mentally. That, that was a compassion and act by Lafayette, okay? Which they've now banned because it's by definition, the human trafficking laws have gotten more stringent. They can't get around it. They would never have banned it if there wasn't more human trafficking laws that outlawed it. And they knew that they were coming for them if they kept it. Okay. They didn't do it out of the kindness of their hearts. Okay. So when you call, when you have a language and you call yourself next gen, which second gen, first gen, you've made an abbreviation. Who has complicated words and makes abbreviations? I don't know. Lafayette and the fake and the space Navy. Okay. Now, so, second second gen isn't exactly a complicated word. I know, but I would say first gen, second gen. No, here's my argument against it. Okay, and this is out. You know, it's feces, it's vomit. If I walk outside and someone poops on all over me, a, a big dude poops and I'm covered in diarrhea, and then he vomits on me and urinates on me. Okay, and then I wash, I go take a shower. I'm not ex feces. I don't think that anybody that leaves that group should we have any assignment or stigma connected to ever being involved in that group because of the nature of it's, it's all about stigma, PTS, SP, out ethics. Everything is about your bad introvert, 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 which is what they accuse the psychiatrists of doing. So, but okay. I'm, I understand, but let me ask okay. you this. If someone sure. said, Oh, that Jamie mustard guy, he's a former Scientologist, right? Would you be like, what would you say? I would say that's not true. I would say I was affiliated with a group that I never choose to join, that I was taken from the west of Los Angeles to a slum in downtown Los Angeles and put into a disgusting baby factory for human, no human touch for the first two years of my life. And then it went on from there. Physical and psychological abuse after abuse till I was fucking 19, except for a brief reprieve in Oregon where we were poor. Okay. Um. I would say, like, I don't think it's anything, Aaron. I think it's a bunch of nonsense. So how could you be ex-nonsense? That for me to say that I'm an ex-scientologist, I would have to believe that there's a viable construct there that does something. I don't. When I see celebrities, I have celebrity friends, people that I think are really good people, 
that maybe got famous while they were doing a course and they associate it with that. They'll never leave because they think that's what did it for them. It's like confirmation bias, right? But I don't, I think you're giving what it is way too much credit. So if someone came to me and said, well, if you're not an ex-Scientologist, what are you? I said, I was affiliated with a dark man manipulative cult, like many other children of the sixties, family of God, Jim Jones. There were thousands of them. This one just is the worst psychologically. It's not the worst physically. There were like family of God was a molestation quote. So one of the things that I don't want to do is get overly attached to my own abuse and having it be special from somebody else's abuse. The sympathetic nervous system doesn't think the child soldier in Sierra Leone or the Congo is going to have the same injury as an SO kid that grew up in the fountain building or the Wilcox. Okay. So there's nothing there. So to call it, to say that you're X that I'm not X feces. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a weird conglomerate. I mean, I heard Karen Dela, Glenn Karen Dela Care calls it a Frankenstein. It's a weird Frankenstein of feces and vomit that does all sorts of weird things. And um, that really just constantly induces dopamine and positive suggestion. Okay. And so why would you say you're X that? Because it's nothing. It's just feces. I get it. I mean, okay. If you so, want me to tell, you, the, the you, want me to tell you what I really think, but argue with me. I mean, I, I, you know, we don't agree on everything and that's cool. And you know what, Aaron? But, but, at the, but at the same time, everyone who's talking about their experience is talking about their experience and you can't say, how can you talk about your Scientology experience without saying that you were in Scientology? So you it seems like you don't like the word former. So if someone said, oh, that Jamie Mustard, he was raised in Scientology, wasn't he? Would you say, listen, no, I wasn't? Listen, here's what, here's what I would say. OK, yeah. I don't believe that Scientology is a thing the same way I don't believe that Sea Org is a thing. This is that being said, I have no judgment. If you want to call yourself a, a second gen or somebody else does nothing but love. Hold on. Okay? Hold on, hold on. It's not uh, I'm just trying I'm just trying to make sure we're, we're um, <clears throat> not talking past each other. Okay. I don't think anybody wants to call themselves a second gen. I think people who do that are differentiating the experience of someone who chose to join Scientology and someone who never chose to join well, Scientology. That, that's, well, that's yet, the, say that. Say so the guy, that's how I do it when I'm talking to someone. I say, this is a guy that chose it, and this is a guy that didn't choose it. That's how I differentiate. Okay. Right? So that's one way I differentiate. But I also think, and I'll go further, Aaron, that I would say associated with a Frankenstein mix of chemical mix of feces and vomit, that it also known as Scientology that I was formally connected to that feces and vomit or involved with it. I don't think there's such thing as a Scientologist. I don't. I think it's somebody that's engaging in something that's hurting themselves and others um, while they think they're doing good. I mean, that's the part that makes it so dark, Aaron, is most of the people that we know that are still in there, like my younger brother, he's a beautiful man, doesn't talk to me. They're good people. It's the best people, the altruistic people that want to make a difference, that want to help. The other thing that I'd like to talk. So I think the language is dangerous. And well, last question on this, yeah. last question on the subject. If, um, if someone was mentioning your brother, John O'Reese and someone said, Oh, Jono, is he, is he still a Scientologist? What would you say? I don't know. I don't know. No, but I don't, but I don't mean whether okay. you actually know or not. Like, let's just say, you know, he is still involved in Scientology and someone I said, would say he is still covered in a Frankenstein conglomerate of vomit, uh, and feces called Scientology, okay. but it's not really anything. Like Fair the CEO enough. isn't even incorporated. Like I just don't see it as anything. Like, you know, you have these people working Thursday at two with stats for years, like this tech that's going to save the internet, opening up a new era of international expansion across the globe, right? You have this thing, this propaganda at all these events. I mean, that stage is so big, it would make Hitler blush. Okay. That's what left so, me. Jamie, yeah. Jamie, we, ha we have to request that our, um, <clears throat> our contributors who watch all of, uh, a lot of a lot of our content. Okay. Uh, someone send me some AI generation of a Frankenstein monster covered in feces <laughs> and vomit. <laughs> okay. So that we can use that to represent. <laughs> okay. So we never have to say the word Scientologist. Okay. Or former Scientologist. <laughs> okay. So like you know, listen, I don't judge anyone. You know, there's a close friend of mine who got out when I was in my 20s who tried to pull me out with her, and I don't think she would mind me mentioning her name. Um, I, and I so wish I listened to her, you know, Sherry Owens. And, um, I, <sighs> um, 
Yeah, I just, I just, I, I, and one of the things Sherry said to me one time was I just like, I want my family. I was just coming back from uh, London. I wanted my family. I wanted to try to have, I didn't, all the other people I knew were involved in this in some way, you know, and they were good people and I loved them and I wanted to see them. One of the biggest misnomers or mis the things that are misconstrued about this group is that only an idiot could be involved in this group. And it was the geniuses involved in this group that kept me in. I had moments of doubt from day one. But then you'd like meet Gottfried Helmwein, like he's a fucking genius. Or you'd meet, you know, um, Kikoria. Or you'd meet, you know, so many brilliant businessmen and scientists that I met in Clearwater. And they were like, God, if, if this was not true, how could this humanitarian genius be involved in this for 30 years? It must be true. That's just my reactive thing, right? So yeah. one of the things that Sherry said to me one time when I was like, I don't know that I can ever talk about it. She said, you have to compare it to coming out of the closet as like a gay person. Everyone needs to be allowed to do it their way. I called Leo one time because I was dealing with some narcissistic people in my life. This is years ago, five years ago. I don't even know that she would remember the phone call. And I was telling her that I was dealing with these attacks. And you know what Leah said to me? She said, Jamie, let me do, let me do you a favor. Uh, stop hanging out with people that act like Scientologists and you'll be fine. <laughs> she was describing judgment. OK, all the terms stigmatize you, your PTS, your ethics, your downstat. It's all about introversion and making you small, you're pliable. OK, so um, but that being said, because it's such a personal experience, if you said to me, um, you know, Jamie, I'm going to call myself an X that for the rest of my life. I'm XSO and I'm X that like all the love, dude. I have no thought or judgment on that. That's such a personal decision. It's like coming out. We can't tell each other how to do that. The compassionate thing is to let each other do that in, each, in the way that the other person has to do it. I was able, I'm, I'm going to be scarred for the rest of my life. People say, well, like, how did you get over it? How are you through it? I'm not. It's an open wound, Aaron. And it probably will be for the rest of my life. You're fucking angry. Your brother's dead. They took your childhood. Okay. How could I possibly have an opinion on you saying, fuck these guys, right? Somebody has to do it. I'm grateful that that uh, you and Mike, you know, at the, in the beginning when Mike first came out, I was very resentful. I was like, how dare him? But when I've seen what he's put himself through, um, I feel like he's found redemption in my respect, you know? Um, but I was terrified, you know? Um, yeah, everybody needs to be allowed to do it with compassion and grace, real compassion and grace, not the compassion of the re-education camp of manual labor running everywhere, wearing a Holocaust um, band. But the real compassion and grace means non-judgment, allowing someone, even the term granting of beingness, such a horrible, horrible term. We all exist. We're all important. And we're all valuable and no one has to grant that to us. We deserve it and we're born with it. All of these terms, this idea that we grant somebody something, it's it's horrible. It's feces. And you could, you know, yeah. So we have to be able to give each other grace and let them do it their own way. So as I say this for me, I ask for grace if you disagree with me. And if you do something different, I give it to you. I don't. I don't, if you told me I'm going to call myself an ex that for the rest of my life, I'm not going to think about it. Other, other, it's all, nothing but love. I'm not going to just try to, I'm not going to fair game you and try to kill you. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, but you see what you, yeah. So, I mean, so, what so you, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Yeah. I know, I know you've had a lot of, um, well, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, anxiety or, or concern about, oh my God, what, what is going to be the results of me speaking out? Is it going to change how I'm perceived? You know, Scientology then come after me. How, how are you feeling? Maybe it's not fair to ask you right now. How are you feeling about having this discussion so far? Good. Um, I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it. I didn't know what was going to happen today. You know, um, I have to be, listen, you're a force of nature. You scare me a little bit. Okay. I'm used to being in, I'm a smart guy. I'm used to situations where I can kind of control the situation. I don't feel like you're controllable. So the only, you know, I decided to talk to you 
because you kept saying, you know, in our conversations, you said some things to me that I couldn't unsee. And one of the things that you said to me was, um, people will think you're more interesting. They'll understand that it wasn't your choice. So when I went to these very important corporate partners of mine or, you know, or, or agents or whatever in, in my life in the last couple of months, it's, you know, you were really the catalyst for that. Um, it was like one of the things that was universal is like, how could you feel embarrassed and humiliated about something you didn't choose? That was not what I expected. Again, the I can't describe the poverty, the physical defilement of my body, the slavery for almost 20 years of just feeling like I was a part of a Borg and I had to do whatever I was told, working seven days a week, 18 hour days, you know, the lack of sleep, you, you can't rest, you know, like, and then just the physical things that happened to me, the, the near death experience that I haven't mentioned, the chronic ear infections, had life so bad every year that that was the only time I would see my mother is when she would comb out my head lice using a steel comb, baby oil and quell, you know, a combination of oil, blood and steel. Chronic head lice so bad that because it had gone on too long. That, it, that at the point you were next to my head, they, they, these things were jumping off my head. Right. And I'm not even getting into you know, roaches and rodents and the criminal activity of the environment. You know, my brother got involved with gangs, one of my older brother. And at one point, this gang that he got, this gang member in South Central, he got involved with, he was doing drugs, doing whatever he was doing. I don't want to throw him under a bus. He's a good guy, beautiful man that wasn't given, you know, he's just a beautiful man. Um, we had to sleep in my mom's auditing room for a week because this kid, uh, was going and he was going to bring his brothers to kill us. And it was a viable enough threat that we slept at AOLA for a week or two in the auditing room, wow. right? People don't understand the inner city nature of this. They don't know that a gang around that environment killed a Seward member with his daughter while walking back to one of the buildings that they house people in on Edgemont. They don't know that 99% of these, these buildings owned by uh, Lafayette Space Navy, the, the Sea Org, are all ridiculously disgusting slums. He's living in the lap of luxury and you live in a slum that you can't even believe. For no money they could fix that compared to what they spend on lawyers. Um, it's, very, it's identical to fascist communism, right? The, the guy at the top. But I do believe he believed it. And uh, I just want love, you know, compassion and empathy and grace to be, I have to you make my own existential choices I want compassion, empathy, and grace to be the way that I treat people. And I want to thank you and, you know, God, Leah. <laughs> I want to thank you and Leah, you know, because I feel like it's really, again, you guys stood on the shoulders of amazing people. Henry, you know, uh, Lawrence Wright, Alex Gidney, Janet Reitman, you know. Uh, but what you and Leah have done is make it understandable to the public. So that I don't feel like less of an, so I feel like less of an alien. You've made it so that people can interpret what it is. When people look at this group, they think, well, okay, Scientology is a cult. Jim Jones was a cult. Charles Manson was a cult. Family is a cult. There's somewhere worse than Moonies is a cult. Jehovah's Witness is a cult. And they're all just cults. And they're all kind of the same. No, they're not the same. Jim Jones killed everyone. I, 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 mean, I want to be alive. I'm happy to be alive. Okay, the family, all those kids got molested, the boys. OK, the Catholic Church has done horrible things. They don't have a monopoly on misery, but in terms of mental control and what, again, one of the reasons I'm here to answer your question is this. Um, over the last 10 years, I do a lot of creative conferences from TED to I hosted a creative conference in the town that I live in over the last 10 years. And one of the things that I saw repeatedly as a creative idea is there was a group that was helping inner city kids. And the way that they help these inner city kids heal is they make them study Shakespeare and write their own story. And what they found is when someone can master their own story, they can master their life. There's another incredible writer friend of mine who grew up abandoned by his parents who were drug addicts and became the most successful guy in the world. One of the most successful public speakers and, and, and guys in the world. He's a good friend of mine. And he always talks about, unless you master your story, you can't master your life. So what this, it's a double, 
It's a double bind. It's a double fuck. Can I say that? Yeah. Okay. They double fuck you in the most abusive, horrible way like this. Okay. First of all, my abuse story is worse than most, but there's some that are worse. Okay. I watch the aftermath. Okay. There's some that are worse. Um, the, uh, um, to live through that is one thing. Now, if I speak out or the dirty daughters of Dynetics speak out or you speak out or all the people that have you speak out or when Danny speaks out, they're like, liar. OK, now what they do is they tell you that it never happened. So they're basically abuse you and then tell you that this horrible abuse that you barely survived, it never happened. To exist through something like that and to agree that it never happened by threat of losing your family. The only way to truly tell your story is to tell your story. You can't just tell it to yourself. Telling your story means telling the world your story. So I'm feeling good in the sense, I mean, I don't know how I'm going to feel. Maybe when I leave, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm feeling good in the sense that um, I think that I'm going to be a better person having told my story. Um, and I'm doing it to possess myself and to get my life back because I think I'm still suffering from things because out of fear and shame, I've already lost my family. They can't take it away from me. Danny ended up homeless in New York. They can't take anything more. Um, I feel that maybe by doing this, I'll get a piece of me back. And I want to thank you for that, because one of the things that you said that stuck in my head, and I don't know that people appreciate you enough, man, you know, is you said people will find you more interesting. People will find me more interesting. And what you've given me the opportunity to do by doing two or three hours, if I if it was 30 minutes, there's no point in doing this. In three hours, you've given me three hours, Aaron. In three hours, we can tell the story. Okay. And this thing that you said to me of people will find you more interesting. That's only true because of you and Leah. And who you like, you and Leah have made this so understandable, like the mind control aspect and how deep it is and how extensive it is. That makes it greater than any other mind control thing that's ever existed. It's more elaborate and it's more powerful and it's more effective. In that way, it's that that's the only place where its stats are straight up and vertical. OK, <laughs> uh, so um, what you and Leah have done. Uh, and again, I've not always like. Like Leah and I share a close friend, but we haven't always been best friends. So it's not like I love Leah. I don't dislike Leah, but I'm just saying that it's not, you know, I, it's on a moral and human level that I feel the need to acknowledge you and Leah is by going out and explaining it over hundreds of episodes or dozens of episodes. It's the only thing that's ever shown how elaborate it is. So it's made it less weird. And I just think that if you guys hadn't done that, I would have lived like this for the rest of my life. So, and I'm not trying to be melodramatic. Um, I've said that to plenty of other people while I've been under the radar the last five years or whatever you want to call it. I said that all the time, like, oh my God, Aaron and Leah, you know, what they've done to, to take out the weird. And I've seen it, you know, people have found out of the years. I got outed when I was at LLC. It was one of the most humiliating things in my life at college. I've been outed in the last couple of years. It's way less different now when I've been outed. It's, people are different because they know about it. They know how it works. And they understand that it's special in the way that it hurts people. Wow. Hey, my earbud just died and I put in the other one. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, guys, for anyone just joining us, uh, the two books that I'd like to encourage people to check out, uh, written by Jamie, is The Invisible Machine, The Startling Truth About Trauma and the Scientific Breakthrough That Can Transform Your Life, and uh, a kid's book about resilience. You can get both of these books anywhere where you get books. Um, and I'd like to make a plea for help based on that. You know, if people are sitting there going, Hey, how can I help this guy? You can buy that book and you can share it and tell everyone you know about it because you don't, you can, you need to know that what you're experiencing is biological and you need to know that you can get relief if you really want it. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, anybody that's listening to this, that has a platform that's decent where I can speak to this biological injury, reach out to me. Is that okay for me to say? I oh, want abso absolutely. Okay. okay. Well, and again, where would you like them to reach out to you? Insta. Follow me on Instagram and reach out to me there. 
Okay, okay. good. I'll, I'll link to your Instagram in the description down below. And or you can just, long, yeah, yeah, sorry. Is it just under Jamie Mustard or is it something longer? It's than Jamie. That? I think it's Jamie underscore Mustard. Okay. I can, yeah, you can check it out while we're on. And okay. you know, somebody can go on Instagram and tell you what it is. You'll see this book, The Iconist, repeated over and over. You'll also see the last post was The Invisible Machine. There aren't a ton of Jamie Mustards out there. I'm easy to find. Okay. So, guys, real quick about the truth rundown. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And by the way, for anyone watching who not only received the truth rundown in Scientology, but was trained on how to audit the truth rundown. If you want to do a video with me about it, please email me at growingupinscientology at gmail.com. Because, Jamie, I'm going to give myself sort of a pass here. I'd never received it. I never audited it. I never even knew. I'd, I'd, heard, I'd heard about it. I'd never even knew what it was until after I left Scientology and read some other people's books who had received this. And it's it's a very few public. The Truth Rundown is something that everyone going through Scientology's Rehabilitation Project Force receives. The Reeducation Work Camp. The where you have to run everywhere. You have to. You can only spoke as spoken to. You wear a Holocaust R band, at least you did when I was yeah. a kid. And you are basically worse than a second class citizen. Hubbard's compassion. Lafayette's compassion. And every now and then a public Scientologist will receive the truth rundown. And I, this was never really on my radar until I read Leah Remini's book. And when Leah, so all I'm going to share with you is briefly my understanding of, of having spoken to a bunch of people who've done the RPF and told me okay. about this. Okay. The truth rundown is basically where Scientology has taken issue with uh, some things that you've reported and complained about. You've said, I observed X, Y, and Z. I think X, Y, and Z of some senior Scientology executives. Scientology goes, well, this person has a distorted idea of the truth. They think something is true and it's not. We need to fix this. So you basically get interrogated for your own crimes, your own harmful acts, your own misdeeds until you come to the realization that what you thought you observed, you didn't really observe. What you thought you heard, you didn't really hear. What you concluded, you now realize was incorrect. And that's why it's called the truth rundown. You have to basically brainwash yourself into convincing yourself that what you previously thought was the truth was not the truth. And now you've come to terms with the truth. And to me, it's the closest thing you could ever come to honest to God brainwashing. Well, you know, I was forced to care for my little brother. The only reason I moved back in with my mother at nine and 10 years old was because she came back from training and she needed someone to care for her child. And I was told that was my job. It was still way too many of us in a one bedroom apartment and it was a slum at 4816 Fountain Avenue. Um, but the idea that my brother slept with a girl after having no parent, you know, very limited parenting, he had a better chance than I did because we lived in Oregon during part of his childhood, um, that he slept with a girl and spent from 16 to 23 on that and went through that process. It makes me want to cry because I raised him from a baby because my mother wasn't around. I, he was my responsibility. And um, he, he doesn't talk to me and I don't blame him. And when you describe that to me, Aaron, you know, I used to get really mad when I would see people that were involved with the group, ex-members of the world, the group, ex-members of the Space Navy involved with the group, talk about brainwashing, because I don't even know what brainwashing is. But I'll agree with what you just said, that what you just described is the close. I would not disagree. That's the closest thing that I've ever described, heard of uh, that technique that you just described, if that's what it is. Uh, that's brainwashing in every definition that I could possibly be imagined. I think it would make the CIA blush. Okay. So yeah. the fact that my brother might've gone through that or did go through that, I mean, seven years, I imagine he did uh, he, half of his life at that point. When you're, I mean, imagine that I know. half of his time on earth. It's crazy. It, yeah. Um, uh, you know, um, I, I just have love and compassion for him and I'm sorry, you know? Yeah. Hey, we almost made it to uh, three hours. Are we going to answer questions? Should we answer questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, let me pull some up. Only, only the super chats get automatically starred and throw it over into their own sections. So those are the only ones I really, and do you, how long do you want to spend answering? I mean, Aaron, I'm in your hands. I'll do whatever you want. I'll, I'll stop in five minutes. I'll go for another three hours. What do you yeah, want to let, do? Let me, let me just see what's here. Let me just see okay. what's here. Okay. Um, okay, Westland, I can't understand why Scientology doesn't value children. I would think they should view them as the future of their cult. It's such a great point, you know, when you look at the Mormons, like how they, this, this group, church, I mean, the church is all, 
it's all made up. Like, hey, if I call this a church, I can not pay taxes. <laughs> Let's make a cross. Like, you don't understand how literal that stuff is, Wesleyan. And uh, but that decision that they made to stop having kids, uh, you know, not a lot of them in the Sea Org. Uh, you're right; it makes no sense. Every major new religious movement, from the Mormons to uh, you know, I'll just use them as an example. You know, having children is a, ma a massive part of the way that they expand the group. And it makes sense, you, you yeah. know. And so I'm not saying neg anything negative about the Mormons. I don't know a ton about that. But so it's absolutely insane. And uh, um, when you look at how many people have been involved in this group or been in the Space Navy and how many people that have been are out, uh it doesn't seem to me like growing something is what their concern is. If you look at like the 40, 30 to 40 original class 12s, what percentage of them are declared? That means everyone that he decided to, you know, 90% of the people that he decided to train into Jedis um, were all SPs. So how workable was his technology? He couldn't even figure out an SP. Right? <laughs> okay. But there you go. All right. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, and then they make Scientology so expensive to do that Scientologists have a disincentive to even pop out a bunch of kids because how are they going to pay for them all to do Scientology? <laughs> it's a real good point. It was a lot cheaper in the 70s. <laughs> yeah. uh, let me know if um, you think you know this person. Jamie, OMG, I had no idea this was your backstory. We met through Desi AO years ago in Pasadena at a Christmas party. I'm so sorry for what happened to you. Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you, Mama83. Send me a message on Instagram. <laughs> and I hope I hope it's because you're a mama and you have beautiful children. <laughs> uh, Ruby Sardison. The question is, is this available in the UK? I think the question is not about the books, but about the treatment. I think there might be a place in the UK. I know it's available in Sydney, Australia. But again, send me a note on Insta. Follow me on Instagram. Uh, send me a note and I will see what I can do. OK. Right. Uh, yeah. And then also anybody that comes through me, I will put I will give you a link, Aaron. OK. I don't know how we should. I have a link from the Stella Center that anybody that used that link gets like something like 25 percent off or something like that, which is significant. You know, um, it's almost three thousand dollars, but I think it's around two thousand dollars with all the discounts, maybe twenty three hundred for both sides. Um, if you compare that to psychotherapy or being on drugs or having or just your bourbon habit. It's, or you amortize that over the rest of your life and just your happiness, I think it's pennies. And I think we're going to see in the next year or two employers paying for it uh, uh, because the military is gunning. And also we're going to see the insurance companies paying for it. That's all in wet under all. It's all happening. Very cool. Christine Nelson, thank you for continuing to show us how resilient, determined and driven former Scientologists are to help not just themselves, but others two uh oh she used the former word i'll take it christine i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> um all right let's see eat more pizza now much respect for aaron having great guests oh aaron is the best interview sorry i thought that was a compliment of you not me i didn't mean uh, it I, you deserve a compliment it's I'm good. Sorry. We'll, we'll share it okay, we'll okay share I, it. i'm a great guest <laughs> say i'm a great guest and uh, and you're a great and you're the best interviewer. There you go. Right. Uh, Lena on me. Would the would the way you felt about your achievements be considered imposter syndrome? You're fascinating. Thank you. I'm going to write my book. You know, it's interesting. I've heard about imposter syndrome for years, and I don't know that I've ever felt that. But I will tell you that uh, I, I felt other things, but I not quite. I always felt like I deserved to be there. I think I have like my grandfather's DNA of being an orphan, <laughs> a beautiful orphan black pence in, in the South. Um, but I will say this. I believe that imposter syndrome is biological and it's connected to flight. Um, making yourself small. If you're small, the tiger won't see you. So I believe that is is mostly a biological phenomenon. And I believe that people that do the dual sympathetic reset will not feel that anymore or feel it far, far, far less. All right. Yeah. Donna Rose, can the treatment help depression? Such a great question, Donna Rose. And I really appreciate you. you yeah. If you actually go and you look up what operator syndrome is, which I think 30% of 40% of the U.S. population has, but it's a military term for special operators coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq that may have never been involved in war directly. They're just carrying allostatic load. If you actually look at that list, depression is on there. I actually, in the book, and I talk about this in the book, and when I and when I do interviews, I actually don't 
include depression on the list. And that's because I believe depression is a result of carrying all the other things. I think if you have a biological injury where you're, that you're, these nerves in your neck, your sympathetic nervous system is lying to your amygdala, telling you that there's a threat around you. And because of it, you're anxious, you're reactive, you can't sleep, you're hypervigilant, you're hyper aroused, you have mild paranoia and doom all the time. You might have some suicidal ideation, a violent ideation. If you're carrying that 24 hours a day, 365, seven days a week, which is what an overactive sympathetic nerve, extra nerve growth in the sympathetic system is, you're going to be depressed. I think it's a manifestation of all the other symptoms. So yes, it can, and it does. Very cool. Yeah. Christine Nelson, I'm sorry I said you're a former Scientologist. <laughs> Five <laughs> bucks for that? All right, you're, you're the best, Christine. Christine, shoot me, a, shoot me a message on Instagram, okay? All right, I appreciate you. Unoffended, yeah. <laughs> okay, those were all the questions. We can't get normal questions from normal people? The problem is we, you know, there's three hours worth of live chat and I can't, okay, I can't just okay. scroll through three hours of chat okay. looking for questions. Okay. But when, when we're doing, are people commenting when we're talking? Oh yeah. Okay. You want to talk about any of that before we go? Like anything that popped up that you liked? Like not scroll through all of it, but just pick one or two. Uh, we're, you're talking about the same in order for me to pick one or two, I would have to scroll through all of it. And okay. Pick. Was it, okay. Do you read it when you're working or do you, do you don't have any idea it was there? When you say when I'm working, do you mean when I'm listening to you? Yeah. When you're listening to me, are you reading live chat? I'm trying not to because people always say I'm not <laughs> okay. paying because people say I'm not paying attention to my guests okay. all the time. Uh, okay, I'm just curious if there was anything in the live chat that came up that you that start, that you noticed. Uh, I wasn't keeping an eye on it because I'm trying to uh, look okay. like I'm no. making eye no contact problem. with you by okay. looking at the camera. Okay. Well, okay, hold on. You know how much I hate that air. You want me to scroll through this shit right now looking for questions? All right. I'll all right. Do it. Okay. Well, we could do it for two minutes. No, that's all right. Go. That's all right, guys. Let me. Uh, no. I, I want to give power to the people that don't want to spend money, but you know, I'm can, your, this is your show. I can shut. I can. Can, shut can you see the live chat? Um, God, I don't know. No, I don't think I can. But I wasn't looking to see it. I've just. Do you see on the right hand side of the screen? There's the. Uh, it says comments, banners, brand. I don't know. I don't know if you can see that or not. I just no, I never got that. Yeah. Oh, it says yeah. live chat. No, I'm not just gonna stare at the screen and scroll through the live chat. Okay, you got it. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I don't have someone in the back starring things for me like other folks. Do. <laughs> okay. All right. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, guys, for all of you who made it three hours with us, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, Jamie, I am going to go through this interview and, um, uh, make, a edit out a whole bunch of excerpts and publish them as standalone videos so that more people can uh, hear some of the anecdotes and the stories and the commentary. Okay. Okay. And I hope that you will get the word out about post-traumatic stress. There is no D. It is an eye. It is a physical injury to the body. You can see it on an fMRI and you can remediate it in two days. And I hope you help me. I hope the word just gets out on that, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. we got one here. Elena Rainerman ordered the book. Never been in a cult, but so intrigued. Uh, you both are amazing. Cheers. Thank you, Ellen. I really appreciate that. Uh, and, and Hey, let's do a whole bunch of chats. This isn't like a one and done. Let's, uh, anytime you got a subject that uh, you want to chat about, just, uh, hit me up and we'll, We'll do a little chitty chat. Yeah, if I could. Yeah, I'll just like pull myself off the ground and we'll see how I do. But yeah, no, it's fine. I'm, I'm feeling I'm feeling good. I I mean, I'm processing a lot like this the whole event was processing and I'll be processing. I'm sure this event over the next couple of weeks. And again, if you have a platform where you think people need to un, need to know the truth, you know, what is real, that post-traumatic stress is a biological injury and the science behind that, um, I would uh, plead whether it is. It doesn't have to be related to any sort of ex member of a high control group. Just any, if you have, if you're listening to this and there's any platform where you would like to talk to me about that, please reach out to me. I would be honored. Okay. Awesome. I want, I'm trying to get the word out. It. It's one of the reasons I agreed to do this. I don't want it to be a secret. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for hanging out with us this afternoon, guys. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. For, for, thank you. Bye. Okay. If you want to see my rock and roll songs, click right on this guitar. And if you want to see an, a different one of my videos, uh, then you could click right in right here. If you have subscribed or not, subscribe right here. Bye.